Hey everyone, welcome back to Beyond Film School. Thanks for joining me on this lovely Sunday afternoon. It is gonna be Super Bowl Sunday later, but I mean, perfect time for me to do a live stream. <laughs> So if you are joining me, let me know you are here in the chat where you are joining me from. I have the coffee. We're ready to go. Had a great morning. I swear I didn't just wake up or I had an overnight. <laughs> oh my God. I'm sorry. I didn't close my window. So sorry for that, but all right. So I hope everyone's feeling good today. And today I'm gonna to be talking about being an assistant director. I feel like I've never really talked about this topic and I've talked about being a PA, being, you know, the, the mistakes on set or being a director and, and all these things, but I've never really talked about my job specifically, why I love it, why I don't really <laughs> follow other assistant directors and their practices. And we're going to get into some common misconceptions, the latter um, of an AD, where they go, what you do before and after being an AD. And overall, maybe just pros and cons, what likes and dislikes, the power control or lack of power control. We're going to get into a lot of different stuff. And as always, if you have film industry questions, I am always happy to answer them. So you can put those in the chat. I will answer them for you. But if you are a member of my membership uh, of Beyond Film School, my YouTube channel, if you are a member, you get priority. And I know all my members. <laughs> I just started, so I know who they are and my members. So if they have questions, they are definitely going to go first. So yeah, I encourage you to membership because I am uh, releasing more and more photos, um, exclusive photos of things that I can't really show publicly on, on uh, you know, all my socials and stuff. So I, but if it's a smaller niche group, I can share certain set photos, I can share certain set videos, give you the nitty gritty of what's happening on set. And the members get that and not everyone gets that. So definitely encourage you guys to get a membership. And uh, let's see, let's jump right into what is an assistant director. Um, let me check the chat, see if anyone's here with me. I hope someone's here. Say hello to me. Let me know you're here. Because, you know, I like it that I'm talking to people. <laughs> I like to know that I'm talking to you guys. And I think that I just kind of sprung this live stream on to everyone because I just decided last night. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do a live stream tomorrow <laughs> on a lovely Saturday night. I think I was very motivated yesterday for some odd reason. I don't know why. All right, so getting into getting into being assistant director, common misconceptions. It's like, if you're an assistant director, you want to be a director. And I think that is true for some folks. They want to definitely be in a, direct, a director. And if you think about the title being assistant director, you're thinking like, okay, well, it says director, so therefore it's got to be in you know, it's gotta be in line with being a director. And it's very, very different. The job of a director versus assistant director is very, very different where an assistant director is gonna be dealing with logistics, problem solving, planning, you know, a lot of the scheduling and, and everything that goes with kind of the nuts and bolts of making something happen. Whereas the director is gonna be, yes, he is gonna be, or she's gonna be the leader of a set. And they are kind of, you know, push the shit forward, make sure you progress, but creatively, and they're dealing with actress performance, and they're saying yes and no to certain creative decisions. So, and assistant directors don't honestly really get to do anything creatively, really, unless it's like background. <laughs> I kind of fall sometimes into the situation where I will be with the director and they'll ask me, hey, Amber, what do you think of this take? What do you think of this thing? frame or whatever. And I'm like, okay, that's a creative question. And I think that if you're asking me, I will give you my opinion, but it's definitely not in my job description. Right? So misconceptions is that if you are an assistant director, and there are many assistant directors, like there is an additional ad assistant director, there is a second second assistant director there's a key second assistant director there's a first assistant director there's a lot of different assistant directors and across the pond and and internationally the second second is known as the third assistant director so there's a lot of them <laughs> they do a lot of different things but all of it's basically dealing with you know handling and managing the actors making sure they are through hair makeup wardrobe getting on set, they know where to go, they know what time to be there, scheduling, all those things. Also scheduling the run of the day. When when should we shoot this thing and how can we do it efficiently to make sure we're not wasting time or waiting for sunlight or waiting for nighttime or all these things. So we do a lot of scheduling and I think mainly it's all about getting those pieces together. Also, 
another responsibility is kind of seeing the, not really a responsibility, but I think the outlook for an assistant director is we have to see the whole picture, right? There are a lot of details that we deal with. So if you are someone who can look at the small details, but also see the big picture, that's going to work really, really well in your favor when you're an assistant director because you have to be able to look at all the pieces together. And that's kind of funny that I, when I think about being an assistant director, I think about kind of the aerial, aerial view of all the departments kind of circling production and like maybe the actors and director are in the middle and like everything around them are all the other departments and bringing all them together. And some people find being an assistant director <laughs> one of the worst jobs on set because they think they have to be the asshole. And that's another misconception is like, if you're an assistant director, you're an asshole. I'm sorry for swearing, but like that is something that I guess goes with the territory for some reason. Like you can run a set, you can run a smooth set without being an asshole. It is totally possible. There are gonna be some times where you gotta make sure you push the crew in the right direction. But you're also, you have to think about you're pushing the crew with certain uh, encouragement, empowerment, making sure you're motivating in the right way. And listen, no one likes to work for assholes. And why do you want to piss people off and just make the atmosphere around you worse? It's horrible. I don't, I don't want to do it. I, I definitely am like, I don't, I don't want to create an environment where <laughs> I'm just going to make people mad and they're grumpy with me. Why do I want to make crew members grumpier? when I have to work with them for 12 hours in that day. Definitely not doing it. That's crazy, right? So the common stereotypes, right, is that they're assholes and they're just screaming and yelling on set. I don't think that's the best way to run a set. That is just not what I think it is. So I will say that if you're an assistant director, <laughs> I want to challenge you <laughs> to just be nice kind, compassionate, empathetic, even. Oh my goodness, I'm saying so many soft words that some people are like, no, 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 you gotta get the job done, we're on a schedule, we did it, did it, But if you think about it, more flies with honey, that whole phrase, right? So I think that being a tough ass, yes, you have to have that quality. You have to have that presence. You have to have you know, that commanding presence. You have to be a leader. You have to be tough. You can't be a pushover. But you also have to have the compassion and the empathy because you are dealing with people, all kinds of people. <laughs> all kinds of people are going to be on set, all types of personalities. And you have to be able to manage and also mediate between people who are not getting along. You don't want to be the one that is creating the friction. You want to be the one to eliminate the friction on set. So I'm always a big proponent of the AD is going to be the one who sets the morale on set. That is definitely an unwritten responsibility because let's get into the responsibilities. Like I said before, responsibilities like you and are planning the shoot. You are figuring out efficiently where to put what scene in the schedule to make sure we have the most efficient day the quickest day possible and also the quickest overall schedule for a movie tv show whatever it is whatever the project is right you're creating that schedule you're putting scenes in certain order and also you're working with certain departments based on what they need and if the order makes sense for example let's just say number one actor She's getting out of the bathtub and she has wet hair. Are you going to put that up first in the morning? Maybe if it, if it eliminates time in the morning, but you don't want to put it in the middle of the day where she's going to get ready, have dry hair, then get wet again. Never have to dry her hair again. You have to think about all those things. Also, when you're dealing with like special effects blood or something, when you, you don't want to put blood on the first <laughs> thing of the day when you know you have other things that's like leading up to certain shots where they d need to be unblooded, right? They need to be clean before they get into the blood. So it's like you have to think about all those things and what order to put them in that is the most efficient and the smartest way to go about it, where you don't have to like go back and waste time and like redo something that's gonna take another 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And also camera equipment, right? How long is it going to take to set up that dolly? How long is it going to take to set up that jib or that crane shot and all these things? So you, the assistant director is taking into account all of these major elements when it comes to shooting, right? So we are thinking about the best schedule possible. And that is before you get on set, before you get on set, before you start shooting anything, you're thinking about that, all that stuff in prep, and you're trying to create the best schedule possible to have the smoothest day. Now, other responsibilities is like making sure the actors know what the hell is going on. And I haven't even talked about communication. You want to make sure everyone, including cast, know what's happening. What day are we shooting this and this? What day are the actors on set? What day are, is, are the locations that we're going to be at? 
knowing what everything is like going to be happening on a certain day, everyone has to know those things. So communication. I haven't even talked about communication. Like step morale, it's like this unwritten thing. But communication, if you are not giving information as an assistant director, you are not, 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 not doing your job. If you are just standing there and you're just yelling rolling, that is not what an AD does. Well, okay, we do say yell, we do definitely say rolling, <laughs> but that is not the only thing. There are so many things that an AD has to do to get to that point to make sure that we can even start rolling, right? There are so many ducks that have to be in a row to make that happen. So set morale, timing, scheduling, making sure you have all the pieces. And this is something that also can can really mess up your day is if an element, a prop, uh, you know, some people have forgotten actors. When certain things are forgotten, you want to make sure that whatever scene you're shooting, you have all the things you need from every department. Maybe it's an important prop. Maybe it's like a prop gun. Maybe it's a certain jacket that should be in on the couch in, <laughs> in the scene when so-and-so walks in the door and you have to make sure you see it. Or maybe it's a hat that has to be reset anything. It has to, you have to make sure you have all the elements. You can't just be like, oh, well, uh, I think, uh, maybe no, you have to over and over. I, and I, I think when I'm on set, I kind of go through this, like, okay, when you're shooting a scene, I think the best case scenario for you as an assistant director, when you're shooting a scene, you should be looking at the next scene and the next scene after that to make sure all the elements are in place. Like, is there a picture car that we need? Do we have it? Is it on set? Is it parked in the place we want it parked? So making sure you're ahead of the game, like by the time you're rolling on that scene, you've already, you've basically already got all the elements you need for that scene. So you should already be thinking about the next thing, right? The next thing you're going to be shooting. So making sure you have all the things so you don't have to wait. For example, one of the shows I worked on, I cannot say what show it is because it's really, everyone's going to know exactly what I'm talking about. We were shooting internationally and there is a big scene with a certain plate of food the actor references this plate of food and then a waiter comes with this plate of food in the scene so we come to the scene we know this scene is coming it's the second scene of the day this is what we're doing and as an ad you're like i don't think i have to check with every department to make sure they have all the things because it's a major thing when you're like when the scene is about a very specific thing and it's like a very prominent item in the scene you you think <laughs> you would think that you wouldn't have to double check with that department well i will say this <laughs> what i've learned from many a shoot is that you always double check because the more important it is in the scene the more i'm going to be checking that it's actually there and it's waiting and it's standing by to be used well in the scene the plate of food they didn't have it. <laughs> they didn't have anything that was remotely close to the food we needed in the scene, so we waited 35 minutes for them to get this plate of food from the place we were shooting. 35 minutes for a plate of food is unacceptable in the world of film. I will tell you this right now. It is really, really pretty bad when you're waiting 35 minutes for a food. And it also makes that department look horrible. And I am a I do not like throwing any department under the bus. I don't want to blame anybody. I don't like playing the blame game. I like playing let's solve this problem game. Like, oh, this is the thing? Okay, I don't care what the who it was or what it was. Let's just fix it. Let's progress. Let's do what we have to do. Because there are a lot of people, there are a lot of ADs and a lot of people that work in film that love to play the blame game and they love to like wallow in that, well, it wasn't me, it was so-and-so's fault. How about this? How about we were, we're already shooting the scene? Let's forget about it. Let's move on. Let's make sure we fix the problem, right? We can address it, but not like wallow in this. Like, well, this person did this. Da, 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 da. <sighs> I have a real big problem with people playing the blame game. Like, and this happens in the AD department a lot with like certain actors may not know what's going on and you want to find out who said or did what and whatever. But sometimes you can't find it and no one's willing to fess up. And I know a lot of people are like afraid to get yelled at. Even us grown adults were afraid to be like blamed for something that happened. But it's like accountability. Accountability, guys. Let's just take that into account. Accountability is very, very... I feel like underrated and very underused, like you being accountable for your actions. If you mess up, if you make a mistake, just admit it. <laughs> just admit it. Just say, you know what, that was me. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to tell this actor this or something. And I will definitely, as an AD, when I was a PA, when I was a key PA, when I was any of these roles, I'd be like, oh, you know, that was my fuck up. I'm really sorry, you know, and might have gotten a tongue lashing from 
so-and-so, or it might have cost the production money. Hopefully not a lot of money, but either way, <laughs> the higher up you go, the more, the more your mistakes are, basically. So when you're making mistakes as a first AD, whew, those, it's, 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 they get deeper, <laughs> they get a little deeper, a little more expensive, and they're a little bit more like, ugh, like a little bit, when you're making mistakes as a PA, it's not usually as bad. It's not like, it's, they're like minor mistakes, but sometimes they can cost people money, so just depends, but you can't be afraid of making mistakes, because those mistakes are what are going to make you better, for sure. Oh my god, I have some things in the chat. Oh my gosh, Shydon's here. Hey, Cheyenne, what's going on? Um, I have Mega Giants 89. I've never seen that person. Um, Chad, welcome back. Um, Anat Singh Hall, hi, watching from India. That's amazing. Patrick is back. Hi, I want to join your PA course. Oh yeah, that's right. So, um, Patrick, um, my set PA course is happening next week. I just emailed you, so check your email. Uh, I just emailed you the new dates. My next set PA class is going to be May 20th and 21st of 2023. So about three, three months from next week's class. So I have it. I already have people in this class, so it's filling up pretty fast. So definitely sign up, put your deposit down to make sure. And I have my space all like uh, paid for. We're all ready to go. I am ready to go for my next set PA course. So um, I'm pretty excited for the course next week. I'm nervous. It's a full class and I, I love how they're all very, very excited. So uh, I don't think I've had that much excitement because each person, when I give them all the information, everyone's like, oh my God, I can't wait to meet you. I can't wait to take the class. Very, very excited. And like literally everyone almost word for word said the same thing to me. And it was kind of like, when you think about it, it's kind of weird at the same time. <laughs> so Mega Giants 89 I have a question. How do you start out to becoming a director and what's the best camera that you would suggest? Oh my God. Okay. First of all, Whew, okay, I, okay, so we're gonna talk, like, like I said, the director versus the assistant director. Now, this video is about, um, oh, okay, Ilma One Martin Sean's here. Hello, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so what I will say is this, that, like I said before, assistant director and director are very different positions, right? We're talking about logistics, problem solving, planning, scheduling, that is assistant director. Uh, managing actors, other all the elements in the department make sure have the things like those are the major responsibilities of assistant director and it is very very different from being a director so how do you start out becoming a director a lot of people think that there are there is a set ladder there is a set way to becoming a director and i will say that that is false it is very very false okay and the reason why i say that's false is because if you look at every director christopher nolan Tim Burton, James Cameron, Steven Spielberg, uh, Quentin Tarantino, like all of these famous directors, uh, Stanley Kubrick, all of these directors. I, I wish I could, would have named a female director and, and one is escaping me and I feel really bad. So if you have a female director, put it in the chat, put it in the chat. <laughs> so if you look at all those directors and you look up their background and how they came up to be directors, they are all very, very different paths. So I want to just encourage you to know, encourage you to take your own path, make your own way, because not one way is going to get you to be the director. And I know that's not what anyone wants to hear, right? So a lot of people have done it through becoming a script supervisor and then becoming a director, becoming a first, uh, you know, becoming a first AD and then becoming a director. And I do know that's a longer path because like be to become a first AD, that is my path. Like to be a big budget first assistant director, major movie, you're going to see my name in the credits, guys, a <laughs> big budget movie, blockbuster movie, I'm going to be on, on in those credits. Okay. Just letting you know, I've done a lot of things, but being a first AD, on a big budget movie is my dream. And it's going to take a long time to get there. And maybe not, who knows, right? It could be a couple years, you never know. Emerald Fennel, right? Okay, there, uh, oh, there you go. Thank you, Andrew. So I think that the line to, you know, through being assistant director to director, it is a path to be a director, but it's a very, very long path, okay? Other people come up, uh, they're, their PAs, and then they become a director's assistant, which is, <laughs> it's really funny when you're looking at assistant director and a director's assistant, two very different jobs. <laughs> so a director's assistant is going to be the assistant of the director is like they are with them all the time and they might be scheduling their dinners or, you know, they're looking at dailies with the director and they're, they're basically with the director all day long and like through the whole process of a movie or the show that they're working on. So they are doing 
like they're assisting the director personally. It's like their personal assistant, right? You can come up that way because you're going to be shadowing a director. And if you want to become a director, if you want to become a director, shadowing a director is a perfect way to do it, to find out, just to see what they do, right? To go through their day, go through the process from start to finish. And for me, I love shooting. So being a director in prep, I'm just like, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't like prep. Or I don't like pre-production in general because I just want to be on set. I like the, the move, you know, the, the action of it all. So that is another path. Other, other, other people are, you know, they come up through different departments. They come up through camera. They, they become a DP. Then they become a director. There are so many ways to do it. But what I will suggest is this. In order for you to get to the point of being a director, you have to have something to show for it, right? That is your music videos, your little small commercials, your short films, your indie feature films. Anything that you can direct, even like your own little personal projects. Like for example, I did a small project, um, a very, very short film because I was like obsessed with this guy. Like when I was well, like, gosh, it was like 10, 11 years ago. And I've, some of you may have seen my little short attention. I was obsessed with this guy and I was like, I have to make a little, little short about it. I think it was like five, four, four minutes long. I was in it, I wrote it, I shot it, I did it, right? And that technically, I directed my own little short film. Even though it was my own little project, I still decided, creatively wrote it, everything performance-wise, did different takes. <laughs> I would like set it up, do it, watch it, <laughs> change it based on what I thought direction-wise I needed to do. So like even your own little projects that you're doing by yourself, that counts as you like being a director. You need to start building your director muscles, basically. And the way you do that is going to do a lot of small things leading up to the big things. Here's a big mistake of people who want to be directors. They start writing these crazy, extravagant scripts, feature scripts. And they're like, I wrote this amazing script, right? I wrote this amazing script and now I'm gonna ask for all the money in the world and I'm gonna direct this script. Okay, <laughs> you are going to jump right into the fire and I don't want to say you're going to fail, but it is going to be extremely challenging to do that. And the reason why I say that is because you, if you've never directed and you're going to go all, you're going to go that big first off, you're going to make so many mistakes and you want to make your mistakes on the smaller projects. And I can say this for being an assistant director as well, being a DP, being any major position, because I will tell you that I have learned so much in the indie world on all the short films I've done, on all the indie features I've done, on all the music videos, commercials, all the things I've ever worked on as a first AD. I've learned so much more than actually being in the union world as a PA, right? I feel like I'm more prepared to be an AD because I've stepped into the role as a first assistant director. And all that can be said for if you're trying to be DP, if you're trying to gain experience as all these big, like, positions like a producer, a production manager, all these things, right? If you're doing them on a smaller scale, it's better because you're actually in the role and you can, if it's smaller, smaller budget, smaller crew, the stakes are a little bit lower, then you have kind of room to just not play around, but kind of like feel out your style, do ha have and make the mistakes that you need to make in order for you to get better. And before you get to that feature script that you're like, I wanna make this movie, I cannot wait to make it, this is my dream movie. If it's your dream movie, just wait. Just wait until you make a couple of projects before that, you know? Just wait until you get, you know, a little bit more experience, you get your stupid mistakes out of the way, and then you're like, you know what, I'm ready to kill this feature. I'm ready to make it, and like, I feel like I'm ready to direct this feature. Because there are so many things as a first time director there's so many mistakes, so many things you're not ready for that you've never experienced because you may have been an actor. You may have been an actor for so long on features or in TV and then you're like, I want to, I don't want to direct. And that is a common path. Going from actor to director is also a path. So that is not uncommon. And the reason why it's a path is because part, a major part of being a director is directing actors, right? And actually getting the performance that you need out of them for the scene and the story. So actors are attuned to that and they're like you know what i think i would direct this scene this way so it's kind of like a natural path for for actors to be directors um but then there's also the technical side that they have to 
I guess, hone in on their skills a little bit. They're like, well, camera this, angles that, composition, um, certain equipment, blah, blah, blah. Now, to get to the other part of that question, there are so many, I, I hope that I answered that question for you, Mega Giants. That's a real big tangent. We talked a, <laughs> a little about being a director. And I think that it's probably not the answer that you wanted, but you have to start small, direct anything you can, get your stupid mistakes out of the way, and then start working. Get your reel, make your reel, get a YouTube, get a website. Like, y'all, okay, if you don't have a website, you're trying to be a professional in, in film, God help you, okay? You need to have a website. You need to have something that people can look at. You need clips, all that stuff. Basically, any position. The only, I think the only position that I would say that doesn't need really any clips is like, because someone asked me for my reel one time, and I was like, I'm an AD. I'm not a fucking director. Like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm not a, I'm not a DP. Like, what, what you see on screen is not really, like, I guess it is part of my job, but like, you're not going to see me really, like, you don't know how many fires I put out, how many problems I solved, um, all the, the schedule, scheduling issues I might've had. So you don't see that based on the real, right? So it's kind of, it's kind of weird. People ask ADs for demo reels and I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> look at my IDB page and you can look at my resume, but you're not, you're gonna, I'm not going to make a reel for you. But if you're a director, DP producer, then you should definitely be making a reel 100% have a website. So the other part of the question is what's the best camera that you have that you would suggest to use? I hate this question because here's the thing. I am not a gearhead. And once upon a time, I was an aspiring director of photography. I love photography. And that's how I started to get into video and into composition and, and fine art photography and all this stuff. And, and that was the route for me. I was a assistant camera, first AC and a camera operator. And that was the, the line for me. I wanted to be a DP. But then, like... People really obsess over the gear and I didn't. I don't care about what camera you put in front of me. I know I'm just gonna make it beautiful. You know, that's the way I look at it. So the camera, and based on what is trendy at the time, it's always what people always wanna use, right? So for a hot minute, it was like the Black Magic, and it was the red camera. And then, um, I mean, the Ari's uh, Alexa are always the tried and true. The Alexa, there's Alexa Minis, or just, you know. so. The cameras, I don't think is a, it's just not a, a big thing for me. And if you're a gearhead and you're like, oh my God, this new camera does this like amazing stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Like you want to obsess over cameras, by all means do it. Um, sometimes the brand new trendy cameras are not exactly what people want to use because they have a lot of, I guess, not like things that are wrong with them that you're finding out what the problems are like you you ha they they have to wait for like the you know the the next version of that to fix all the like the little flaws that they might have so going with the trendy new camera that just came out I don't tend to want to go after like maybe the one that like like you know when uh let's see the Canon Mark 5 II or whatever like the full frame cameras that was huge for a while and I'm I stand by that camera because um, the Canon's full frame cameras are beautiful. If you have just the right lenses, they are beautiful. They really, really are. Full frame cameras are amazing, but it is a little techy when you're trying to shoot a whole movie with one. So there are flaws and there are a lot of learning curves with a lot of different cameras. And I know I'm, I feel like I'm getting a little bit, bit deep into the cameras, but I just want you to know as far as your cameras, oh yeah, 5D Mark II. Yes, there we go. I was like, I know I have the, the, the language was wrong. So I'm glad, Sean, you know what I'm talking about. Like the full frame uh, 5D Mark II, that is a beautiful camera. I remember, oh God, I wanted that camera so bad, but then I was like, it's too expensive. <laughs> I remember it just being way, way too expensive. So um, yeah, so best camera is the one you have with you. I think that is a fact because if you obsess over a camera that's brand new that you don't know how to use, you're gonna be fucked when it comes to time on set. If you don't know how to use it on set, if you are not completely comfortable, especially if you're doing something that is indie, small budget, and as far as like, it's something that is gonna be a short film that you have only two days to shoot when you have like 10 pages or 15 pages in two days, you gotta run and gun. And if you don't know that camera and if your ACs don't know that camera well enough, you're it's gonna waste a lot of time and all it's gonna do is like take more and more shots off the director's um, shot list and the movie is gonna suffer. So you need to have a camera that yes, you have with you and you realistically can like use 
on the day quickly, a camera that you're comfortable with as far as like you doing your own stuff. So, but if you're doing like big budget stuff, people go with mini Alexas and Alexas and all that stuff. Um, Patrick, what does it take to break into film industry without experience realistically? All right, Patrick, listen, if you're gonna take my set pay class, you are gonna know all about this and I will give you all the information when you're in my set pay class. So stay tuned for that answer. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, I really, I really do jump into that on, in, the, in the class. So. Here's the thing, is that if you have no experience, you need to get in online, you need to go in those Facebook groups, you need to like go at it. You cannot, you need to persist. You need to email and post and like you like not harass and not spam people's pages because we can hate that, okay? So you need to make sure you're in those groups your city film production jobs. I mean, get on all the film websites. I mean, I am not an advocate for uh, promoting websites that make you pay a subscription, but some people are like, hey, it pans out. It's only this much a month and I get so many jobs from it, blah, blah, blah. But I'm not in the, the realm of suggesting you join a website that makes you pay, right? Get on those apps and you really, really, really need to just not quit. I will tell you that persistence is... 90% of people's success in film, I swear to God. <laughs> Being at the right place at the right time is the other 10%, but persistence is the other, other percentage. And people are like 90%, like, cause people quit. It gets hard and people quit. If I had, and I almost quit, I almost quit. I almost was like, fuck film, I can't do this anymore. It's so hard. It's like, and I almost did, and I, I'm glad I didn't. I really am glad I didn't because I was like, maybe just, just keep at it. Because, I mean, I didn't want to give up on my goal and my dream, and now I'm even closer now. So I think that what it realistically takes is making sure that you put your best self forward, knowing yourself. Because here's the thing. Some people will obsess over getting their skills sharpened and honed in as far as filmmaking goes. Like, what do I got to do to be a better PA and a better this and a better that and a better blah, 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 blah. Like, let's not worry so much about the responsibilities because, listen, the, you're going to be able to take coffee orders, manage background, and uh, manage cast, no problem. You can learn that on the job if you know yourself. If you know yourself, if you understand your flaws and weaknesses and your strengths, you will go further. And I fully believe in that because people don't put enough weight in themselves because if you know yourself you will handle situations better and I think that people just don't realize that because and then for a while I didn't even know who the hell I was I had anger issues I was hating the world and I was like why am I not getting jobs and it took a lot of like inside work for me to be like oh you know this is what I got to put forward this is like this is who I am I found the people who got along with me and like once you know yourself then you can mesh with the people that you get along with most and then those people are the ones that are going to offer you more and more jobs so if you have any types of I mean everyone has them everyone everyone has problems flaws things they have to work on with themselves right but then they, they don't want to. They don't want to look inside. They just want to be like, well, if I get better at this, I'm going to get more jobs. No, you can get, you can be the best camera operator you like to like God's gift <laughs> to a DP. You know what I mean? But then if you are an asshole and you have an ego and you you can't get along on anybody, you will get less jobs. It is a fact. <laughs> so that gets to know like that is about you getting to know yourself like who you get along with, like know it, like maturity, patience, compa like all of these things, like working with people on set. It's not about the outside. It's about the inside. I just want to, I just have to stress this. I have to stress it. Okay. Um, oh God, I just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just totally just knocked over my whole desk. Okay. Um, you could buy a $20 disposable camera, 27 photos each photo, a frame, use a, ca a phone camera, learn the basis of composition, lighting and movement and, and the why behind how they help tell a story. Yes. Pick up a book. Read, folks. Read. <laughs> also, Robert Rodriguez's 10-minute film school video on YouTube will give you some other solid advice. I, I'm really glad that you brought up Sean Martin. I'm really glad you brought up Robert Rodriguez because I read his book. Do I have it here? Oh, my God. Do I have it? I don't. I think I gave away that book. Wait, I think I gave it away. Yeah, I definitely gave it away. But I have, um, I read uh, Rebel Without a Crew. That's such a good book. Him trying to make his first... Movie, 
absolutely stunning. Absolutely amazing. You're like, holy shit, this guy was given blood <laughs> to like make as much money as he could to make his first feature. And like based off that feature, that built his career. So, and he didn't stop. Some of the things he had to go through. So definitely read Robert Rodriguez, Rebel Without a Crew. That's a really, really good book. Oh my goodness. Okay. I will say like to jump into assistant directing, uh, assistant directing again, indie ADing versus union ADing. And I got into the positions a little bit with assistant directors as far as like there's a first AD, there's a key second, there's a second second, which is also a third, uh, also known as a third assistant director in other areas of the world. And then you have additional. And then there's like a base camp AD. So there's so many different ADs on a union set. You have a bigger team, which is amazing. You have bigger stuff. And it makes sense because you have like a bigger crew. You have more cast. And maybe there's stunts and all the stuff you need. Oh, yeah. And then more background, all these things. In the indie world, <laughs> I have found myself as an indie first being the only AD. So I did everything. So, for example, when you're an indie <laughs> first assistant director... You're making that call sheet. <laughs> you're gonna sh you're gonna go and shoot the day, and then after wrap, you're gonna make the next day's call sheet. <laughs> so people are like, "How the hell did you do that?" And I, I honestly look back at my indie AD days, and I'm like, I don't know how I managed that. And I I didn't work on the call sheet during the day, but I just took a few hours after call. And what I used to do to give the crew a heads up. Because I knew the information. You always know the information. And if you don't know the information, by the time you're making your call sheet, you're fucked. Basically, the production um, and producers didn't give you the information that you needed, right? So as an indie AD, I would wrap after like a 10, 11, 12-hour day. I am really good at wrapping on time. I do not go over. I, I am super efficient. It's only, it's only been, a, I would say, a handful of days where I went over 12 hours. A handful of days. My track record's like really good. I will say that track record's really good. Not to brag. I need to brag. <laughs> but I would wrap. And then what I would do is I would quickly send out an email to all the crew. And this is like maybe 30 to 50 people. And I would say, hey, tomorrow our call time is this. This is location. This is the crew call. Call sheet to follow in a couple hours. Because they knew I was the only AD. So they gave me grace knowing that like I was on set all day. And then I had to make a call sheet when I wrapped. So like, Thank God for the crew that I, I mean, maybe at the time I didn't realize that they gave me, they understood that I was the only one doing all these things. So that's something that you couldn't expect as a, an indie assistant director is being the only assistant director. So you're going to be doing the call sheets. You're going to be dealing with all the background. You're going to be dealing with all the cast. You're going to get the cast ready. You're, <laughs> you're going to run the set. So it's, it's not like in the union world where the first AD gets to come to set at call. And then the key second or the base camp AD is there earlier, a couple hours earlier than the crew call, and they're getting cast ready and the stunts ready, and they're getting everyone through hair, makeup, wardrobe. And then, you know, then they send them to set, and then the first AD takes and runs the day with them and whatever, right? And it's and the first AD has a second second on, on set with them to help with managing the background and the cast and all the PAs and stuff like that. And sometimes I didn't even – I had, like, a couple PAs as an AD, like – I was, I'm, so I think on a number of productions, when I was on an independent film or short film, I maybe had one or two set PAs and they were super green. So I was definitely training a lot while trying to run a set and while trying to give them stuff to do that were, is actually helpful for me in production. So that was, that's the major thing with indie ADs versus union ADs that, you know, you're basically an army of one. Versus union where you have like a whole team that handles a whole lot more stuff, which is, I mean, amazing. Also, the pay is better when you're a DGA in a union AD. It's pretty nice. It's way better because I would say whereas you can make anywhere from a, based on all the different levels of ADs, like you can make anywhere from 430 a day. Now, this is like big budgets. Like I'm thinking like majors, which is like $15 million and up. Uh, of whatever the budget is, you can make anywhere from four thirty a day as a additional AD all the way up to about, I think, 1400 a day as a first AD. But then that's not including your production fees. And then your, like, your production fee is like an extra, I think, three or $400 a day. So, and I actually was a, a first AD on a stunt day for Equalizer. Equalizer. 
um, happened last season, earlier this season. Oh gosh, I can't remember. No, y'all, it was in August of this year. And that check for that one day for being a first AD, I was like, whoo, that was a lot of money. <laughs> it was almost $2,000. So I was like, for one day of work, $2,000, being a union AD is pretty nice, and that's why it changes your life when you go from PA to AD overnight. You're just like making a ton of money, and you don't know what to do with it. And I mean, that's obviously if you are blessed with having a job right after when you get into the DGA, obviously. So, oh yeah, I have matcha too, and I have to mix it. I had sort of a cold, so I'm like really like, God, do you like the green tea? So that's like the big difference is like staff and money, but also as an indie AD, I found that a lot of the production really relies on you for a lot of things and you have, I feel like more control weirdly enough, or I, maybe it might be a me thing. I don't know, but in the indie world, it's kind of like, I really felt like I was a team member of the producers trying to make the best day possible. And like there was more synergy and it might be the same because I'm not a first yet in in the DGA as far as like being like a, a staff first right I've done a couple days as a first but not like full-on full project as a first AD in the union world yet so I, I just felt like there was like more collaboration to try and make sure you got the day and it's like they really not relied on me but they looked to me to be like does this make sense can we do this how about this there was like way more there was a closeness that I really liked that sometimes you don't get in the union world. And I always tell my sub PA trainees about this where it's like people kind of look down upon indie films or short films or music videos and commercials because they operate differently, but also like they are, it, it's a, an environment where you are going to learn so much more if you are just starting out because you have more grace, you can touch more things, you can be involved in way more things than you would be on a union set. You know, you can help with like grip, ele uh, grip electric and camera and you can help with props and you can help the art department and all these things. Whereas like you can't really do that in the union world where you have to like be a union member to, you know, even touch a prop. So, or even the cast chairs for that, for that matter. So I feel like there's an environment in the indie world where if I wanted to be a producer and I'm an AD, well then I can tell the producer like, hey, you know, I'm, I want to learn more about what you do. Then it's like, they'll have you work with them more. It's just more inviting and more family oriented. And there's a closeness and you just like, you can learn so much that you can bring to the union world to get them union checks. You know what I'm saying? You get that money. <laughs> um, oh, it's like, oh my God, there's more things. Um, just to make sure if you are in the US, the IRS get the right amount. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, that money was taxed, okay? That, okay, that definitely was on payroll. Don't worry, Sean. <laughs> it was on payroll, but it was a lot of money. And it was like, uh, I think, I forget what my gross versus net was, but like they, a lot of taxes are definitely taken out of my check. That is for damn sure. <laughs> Matt Wilder, hey, hey, hi, hi, thanks for joining me, Matt. I think, uh, we, we talk on Instagram, don't we, Matt? I think, I think this is the same Matt we talk on Instagram. He de DMs me all the time. I love when I get DMs from everyone. They're like, hey, Amber. <laughs> so, Mega Giants, thanks for answering my questions. I have some more questions. How long is the shoot while on set per day? Okay, so, basically, for the, well, I mean, post-COVID times now, I mean, pre-COVID when, when the pandemic was happening, I feel like we're still in it. I have no fucking idea. We're in it. We're out of it. I have no fucking idea. I have no idea. So when the pandemic hit and we wanted 10 hour days and we were really trying to shoot for 10 hour days and schedule 10 hour days, but that never happened. So we went, we went right back to 12 hour days. So you're shooting, shooting now crew call to wrap should only be 12 hours, right? So when you're shooting, it's 12 hours. That's not counting all the prep before that, like when cast is getting ready, when locations is setting up, when teamsters are parking the trucks, like all that happens even before that 12 hour day is even started, right? So like a teamster could work anywhere from like fucking 16 to 20 hours in a day where it's like the camera person only worked 12, right? Because the camera person is going to be in a crew call wrap and then like camera operator doesn't stay to load shit like usually they're just like deuces buy them out <laughs> so like 
for PAs and ADs, we're working like 14 plus hours depending on the shooting day. So I, like as a second second AD, uh, I would be there usually a half hour before call, depending on what the first and second wanted me to be uh, in. And then let's see, 12 hours of shooting, 12 and a half, that makes 12 and a half hours. And then I usually have to stay until the last man is out. So that's like wrap supervision. Right. So I have to say an hour usually takes an hour for loadout, hour and a half. So I've gotten to 14 hours. If it's a 12 hour shooting day, 12, 12, 14 hours. So shooting day should be 12 hours. If it's more than that, then everyone else has a longer day outside of anyone who's there earlier or there later. So it's a whole thing. So always expect at least 12 plus hours if you're in the 80 department. Other other departments usually 13 because they're loading to the trucks and loadout takes, you know, at least 45 minutes to an hour. So 13 hours if it's a 12 hour shooting day. And you could get lucky where, you know, for example, when um, that HBO show Girls, uh, Lena Durham, Lena Durham, gosh, am I saying her name right? Jesus Christ. Okay, probably not. She only wanted eight hour shooting days, which is like, Bless. I don't know if that's a if that was a fact or not, but that's what I heard is that there are some HBO shows that only shoot for eight hours. There are some shows who only want ten hour shooting days. So it's really network based sometimes as well. So that depends. So I know that was a loaded answer. Actually, I, I wish I, it was like really simple, but it depends on what department you're in. But expect twelve plus hours. F- uh, okay. So the other question for an AD: How would you value the importance of being this uh, being the same page with the cast? Mega Giants, I need you to elaborate on this. Like, what do you mean being on the same page with the cast? I just need a little bit more um, because here's the thing. <clears throat> we, inter- as a- assistant directors, we are going to be interacting with the cast a lot. So we are the ones that give them their uh, call times, their schedules, their data days, the, the days that they are working out of the episode or the show. And um, it's like we have to work with their schedules and their agents and their managers to figure out, like, does our schedule match up with their schedule can they you know we have to compromise on like because you know actors famous actors especially they, they have they do a lot of pr they're doing other projects they're going to you know night shows they're going on you know daytime television shows so it's like they're doing interviews all the time there's a whole bunch of stuff that they're doing so being on the same page with cast as far as like you mean getting along with them or do you mean, I, I just need a little bit more for that question because it could be very loaded. So Raul Hernandez, I don't know if you've been on the live stream, but welcome Raul. Um, thank you for commenting. Aiding is a lot of a lot of work. Much respect to you all who do it. I could never. <laughs> Thanks Raul. I think that, that I love when I hear that because I love what I do and some people are like, Amber, you're insane for loving what you do um, being a uh, assistant director. Uh, I have a friend of mine, Scott, He's a producer and a stunts coordinator, and he's also, I think, an armorer as well, but he knows a lot about um, guns and stuff like that. He's actually been on uh, CNN a couple times about the whole Rush situation with the the incident that happened uh, on that movie set, and uh, he <laughs> says, and he swears by, he goes, the worst position on set is being the first, first assistant director. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't believe that because I believe that the worst department is locations. They got the worst. I think locations by far has it the worst on set. And like, let me know in the chat what department you think has it the worst because I could never be a locations manager. I could never be a locations assistant. Unit PA, I, would, I could never survive in that department. But some people who are in the department, they love, 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 love what they do. So I, <laughs> I find that very funny that you're like, yo, I could never. Some people would lose their minds. And I've gotten so many comments about like, how do you do this? How do you do this? But like, I, I don't know. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's great, but every day is different. And I love that. Um, <laughs> yeah, same Matt. Let's see. Um, yo, okay, good, good Matt. Yeah, yeah. Hi Matt. Good. We're the same, same Matt. Okay. Um, Roll. I'm trying to be an assistant editor. I'm not about that set life anymore. Yeah. Some people are, um, Roll. I don't know if you saw my, my video series about being an editor, but I definitely encourage you to check it out. Like I got to interview these editors and I got like the real, I don't know what, what, what it's like to really live as an editor. And I think that you might benefit from that. I'm not sure if you have, or is that okay. AE, I think you're talking about editing. Cause that could be like 
associate, no, yeah, no, yeah, editor, what am I thinking? Okay, so if you want to know more about that, I mean, definitely look into it if you're trying to learn more, but if you are an assistant editor, then, then please, like, let me pick your brain and you can, I can ask you all the questions about being an assistant editor. <laughs> um, set life is hard and I know that for me, as assistant director, I know probably physically speaking, I have like a good 15 more years in my body to probably survive on set, but I try hard to make sure that I can sustain those hours on set because it does have a wear and tear in your body, especially you're standing, you're going, you're doing like 20,000 steps. And like just the, on Friday when I was on the equalizer, I didn't even realize, I was like, oh, I haven't really moved around that much. I mean, I'm going in and out, back and forth to holding to set, grabbing background, doing the thing, setting background. And I'm like, oh, I'm at 20,000 steps already. Did not even realize. So there are some days where you're like, oh, you definitely feel it on your body. And then the other days it's not it's not as bad. So definitely the wear and tear. So Raul, I understand, totally understand. Um, Obi-Wan Martin, depends on where you are in the world here in Ireland and a lot of Europe, it's a 10 hour shoot day with one hour lunch, but then there are set up and pull down too. So exactly. So I think that, um, you're totally right. There are other places in the world that are like way better at having shorter days on, on set which I wish we didn't have a 12 hour shooting day. If we had a 10 hour shooting day, I'd feel like we were getting nothing done, but we're, it would be a real quick day. When we have, when I have movies and projects that are 10 hour days, I feel like I have much more of a life than I do when it's a 12 hour shooting day. And it's only two hours of difference from the two, but like those two hours is just, it just makes a world of difference. It really does. I feel like it's really, I can't, it's it's funny how time is so relative, but those two hours, especially if I if, if I'm shooting in the city versus if I'm shooting in New Jersey, because I'm based in New Jersey. So if I have a New Jersey job, I am so grateful. I am so grateful because my commute has just been cut in half. Right? I'm not going through rush hour traffic. I'm not wasting an hour and a half in the morning based on when the call time is. I'm not wasting like an hour getting home. You know, because by the time I I would say by the time most things wrap, like I'm either in rush hour or I'm in the construction <laughs> time of the night where it's like, it's 11 p.m. and they just started construction in New York or I'm just like, oh my God, it's gonna take me just as long to get home as it did to get into work and it's such a bummer. Like, So when I have a New Jersey job, I am grateful because my commute has been cut in half and like those extra hour, extra half hour is just so, it's just, it's just so much better just to have just a little bit more so yeah, roll is a new, oh, new Jersey. Good, good, good. Yay. <laughs> Wear a New Jersey roll. Um, let's see. Um, Patrick, is Buffalo, New York good to start off and film? I mean, Patrick, I think you know that I'm from Buffalo and that's where I got my start from. So, but I mean, I started in camera in Buffalo. So there is a lot of things happening in Buffalo and there's actually more things happening in Buffalo now than there was when I was there. And I left Buffalo in 2010, 2000, 2000, 2009, so, yeah, so I went, I moved to LA, I think, in 2010, no, yes, yes, yeah, I moved to, yeah, <laughs> it was like 2010, so 13 years ago, it was a completely different environment, but they still had a lot of stuff for me to work on, so, like, I did shorts, commercials, feature films, like, in Buffalo, so definitely, and, and I believe that Buffalo is still doing the 48-hour film project. The 48-hour film project is such a good competition and a challenge that I think I, if you are in, in, um, the States, I think it's actually worldwide now, like, I'm pretty sure it was, it was back then, like, I don't know if it's still a big thing internationally, but in the US, like they're still doing the 48 hour film challenge. And they, I think Buffalo was really big on that. I don't know if they're still doing it. Yo, I wanna look it up right now, actually. I wanna look this up right now. <laughs> because now I'm like kind of curious. So please be patient with me because now I'm like, because I worked on a number of film challenges. I actually, was an AC assistant camera on one of them. And it kind of got me a, a lot of credits. You know, it gave me my start. It gave me the, those few lines on my resume that I really needed. So yeah, we have, let's see, there is a, oh, yo, I'm about to just put this in the chat, y'all. Wait, first of all, let me get on the chat. <clears throat> I have to pop out my chat, I didn't do it. Please stand by, guys. And yeah, definitely. Thanks for everyone for and like putting your questions in there and everything. And I just, I love it. I love it. Let's see. 
I don't know if I can pop out the chat. I don't think I can now. I have to go to the page. Okay. Yeah, so I appreciate everyone joining me and interacting. I really, really, really appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to put it in here. I hope y'all can hear me now still because I, I muted something. Okay, good. My microphone's still working great. Okay, so once this ad stops, I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is the 48-hour film um, thing in Buffalo, and I like that it's there now still it's still happening which is great okay yeah so the 48 hour film challenge is so good to gain experience like if you're trying to direct your own thing you can make your own team it's just i feel like it's so it's so amazing to really get your first types of things and outside of, outside of, you know, trying to reach out to people and be like, can I be, you know, can I work on your thing? So I like that. Okay, let's see. There we go. Okay, now I've popped it up. Lovely. So yeah, 40 hour film, 48 hour film project, definitely like look into that because it's real, such a real good resource to, Everyone just like getting their feet wet in new positions. I think it's so valuable. Okay. Can we have more questions? More questions. Okay, great. So, um, so uh, we're getting back to Mega Giants. Amber, I mean to be on the same page as far as the script story direction of the movie and the same page while on set. Yes, of course. So as assistant director, if you are not on the same page and you don't know what the hell's going on in the script story and the, in, in the vibe of the movie, like... You shouldn't be there. <laughs> like, I know that I said that, um, you know, we deal in logistics, planning, problem solving, all these things, but we have to know the story as well. We have to know what the director is looking for. So one really good thing for me that I do that I think is useful for the director is like keeping in mind what they're looking for, the vibe that they're looking for, what they want the character to do, what is the character, like how are they, how are we framing that main actor or actress or whatever, right? So I always keep in mind of the vibe that the DP is trying to go for and the director is trying to go for. Because if I see something amiss, I will definitely be like, hey, just so you know, like this is a little bit, I'm just flagging this for you. Sometimes they're like, oh shit, thanks Amber. Sometimes I'm like, no, it's fine. So you have to keep an eye out for certain things like that. Like you need to know what's happening in the story. You need to know those things. You need to make sure you're paying attention to those things. And that's, that. thanks for saying that because that, that's actually like a really good point to point out, like to make sure that you are paying attention to actually what is happening creatively. And, and sometimes, I mean, not to be like, yo, that actor can't act, but there have been some moments on set where the director or the DPs looked at me and I've looked at them and they've kind of like looked to me to be a, like, are you convinced? <laughs> Is, you know, and I kind of give them reassurance, like, I don't think it was good or whatever, because sometimes they will ask you for that, I guess, tone check, right? When you're, when you're really kind of in it. And they, as an assistant director, they will look to you for those things we're like does this make sense does this work i don't know if it works because they need sometimes even though you're a director you're a big badass director you need validation sometimes and you need to hear that yes this worked out yes that looked great and i have done that so many times for my director because i know they need to hear it because whether you know it or not as a director self-confidence is a thing self-esteem is a thing like making sure like you're doing the right thing you have self-doubt you're like i'm am i am i in this for the right reasons am i doing the right thing like you have a lot of questions when you are directing and if your dp and your first ad are not saying yo that was great that looked beautiful or whatever like and there's no one kind of reassuring you sometimes not all the time doesn't need to be all the time but if i see something that looks absolutely fucking amazing and beautiful on screen and that performance was spot on and we got the focus right and everything the stars aligned and everything was amazing i will say it and i'm not afraid to say it because i'm just like that was fucking beautiful and like they're like they need that feedback and everyone needs that feedback and i think that you know just because you're in those big bad positions 
doesn't make you immune, doesn't make you like bulletproof. <laughs> we all have feelings, folks, male or female, I don't care who you are. Okay, so yes, Ro, you're in Middlesex County, nice. Perfect. I mean, that's, wait, Middlesex is not that far away. We're, that's still in, like, northern New Jersey, right? I believe. I believe so. Um, okay, so Obi-Wan, first AD, due to it being physically and sometimes emotionally draining, script supervision on a dialogue-heavy film that allows lots of improv sans script department. So, yes. So, I think so. Everything is sometimes, like, I, I posted the other day. I don't know if you guys are on my Instagram. If you guys are not on my Instagram, please follow me on Instagram, Beyond Film School, at Beyond Film School. Got reels and all good stuff there. But if, if, if you saw the post I had, I, I had a post about a green screen. It, we had a, um, a day at the, the, the stage. It was all green screen. And I was like, it's such a chill day. And one person was like, the comment was, what's so chill about it? And I'm like, I'm not even going to give you the time of day to explain why it's chill. Because for an AD, it's chill because not that many actors, no company moves, <laughs> no background, no children, no animals. <laughs> and those are the things that ADs always were just like, oh my God, it's just one car, green screen, camera, a director, one actor. <sighs> Amazing. That is such an easy day for an AD. And we're just like, yes, we're chilling. We're chilling. But I think I mean, he might've been a different department, but even if it's, you know, camera or grip and electric like we're at the stage and we're only doing green screen come on it's such an easy day i was like man it took me everything not to respond and be like fuck you <laughs> i can't be like that on my instagram but you know what i'm saying like i don't know how you guys feel about that but if you've definitely done green screen shoots like it's somewhat easier based on like what you what the you know opposition would be like on the street on location dealing with like in that movie we were dealing with picture cars period piece Lots of background, lots of actors. It was it was a lot. So when we had a chill day, one actor, one car, green screen, stage, whew, easy stuff. But he, I don't know. It's a, like, I, I definitely, for an AD, those are easy days. So, um, yes, thank you so much, Patrick, for answer uh, for asking that question so I could a uh, answer it. So I'm, I'm hoping that these answers are not, like, so outside the box. I'm like, this bitch is crazy. <laughs> George Pearson. Oh, I'm originally from East Orange, New Jersey. Oh, nice. Great. Essex County. I, yeah, I used to live in Essex County. Yeah. So anybody ever tell you that you look like a young Polly Perrette from NCI? Yo, everyone tell, wait, is that that chick with like the black hair and like, now I gotta look her up. Oh, we're gonna look her up. Let's see. Polly Perrette. Let's see. George, now I have to look it up. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's see. Okay. It's funny because like I put in Polly and she came up. Yeah, everyone says I look like her. I get that a lot. They're like, I, I've gotten it a couple times where people are like, you look like that chick from N uh, NCIS. I'm like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> but yes, I have, I have uh, gotten that a lot. Actually, I've gotten like Amy Lee and someone called me, someone was like, there was some other person that they're like, you look like her because I have dark hair and green eyes and every actress that has dark hair and green eyes, they're like, you look just like this person. <laughs> Um, Amber, uh, I, okay, so Matt Wilder, uh, Amber, I don't think you saw my question above, if you don't mind. What, uh, let me look at the question, let me see, I gotta scroll up. I, let's see. Oh, yeah, yo, Matt, I missed a whole bunch of stuff here. Okay, Matt, I'm gonna get to you. Um, yes, okay, so yes, I got to the Buffalo, New York, good place for film. And then that's where I, that's where I left off. Okay. So Matt, background actor here, Amber, what do you need most from a background actor on set? Oh my God, that's such a good question. Thank you for this. Thank you for this, Matt. This is such a good question. Okay. So Amy Lee, uh, George is the, the chick from Evanescence. I don't know. Cause she's got light green eyes and she's got dark hair and she like has this dark vibe about her. Cause I wear nothing black all the time. So, so Matt, to get to your question, what do I need from a background actor? What I need is this is to, for you background actors to just pay attention to what I'm saying. As an AD, like I'm your go-to person. So like if you have questions, always come to me or my background team. Also, making sure you know what's going on. So like paying attention, asking questions if you have them. And when you leave set, you got to tell one of us. You always got to tell the ADs or the background PA where you're going. Because what happens is this, is like certain things in certain scenes, we'll have 
very featured background where like it might be someone who is in line before our principal actor and they walk away and that person can't change because that is a featured background they are gonna we're gonna see their face we're gonna see what they're wearing and we can't just put anybody there once we establish you in a very featured area spot or whatever you if at all like I need to know where you are at all times like you can't sneak off to the bathroom you can't sneak off the crafty you can't you can't do that so from background actors I definitely need you to make sure if you are stepping off set to tell your ADs um, additional AD second second AD like you need to tell them even if if you're right next to the first tell them if you can't get a hold of anyone else like because it, we will tell you and it's really really hard for background actors I will say that as an assistant director it's really hard to make sure we're giving breaks to the background, but then also it's cold outside and it's it, it's also hot outside and we need shade for them and getting you guys water, making sure that you guys have everything you need, but also making sure that you get to crafty because I know you want snacks too because like you're starving, we, you haven't had breakfast in like six hours ago or whatever it was and making sure that like you're there when we need you. Those are the major things. So, and I think making sure that you're not difficult, <laughs> but also that you have a good attitude. I think that's the best thing. Just make sure, pay attention, you ask questions, you tell me if you step off set, and you know, have a good attitude, because I'm there to have fun. And this is the thing is, is on my sets that I work on, my throat's getting kind of dry. On the sets that I work on, I wanna make sure that I'm having a good time. I want to make sure that I'm setting you, I'm giving you storylines, I'm giving you your motivation, I'm giving you directions, giving you all different types of things to do. But also, like, I want to make you laugh. I want to joke with you. I want to, like, know your name. I will always ask, if I'm moving background, I will always ask that background actor what their name is. And I'll, like, it It was funny, just on Friday, I had this background actor, his his name was James, and he was number nine. Because every time we talked, he was like, I'm James, number nine. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like a joke. It wasn't like this weird thing. But uh, like I knew his name. He knew mine. And like every time he saw me, he was like, hi, Amber. <laughs> so it was like just knowing background actors' names is a good thing as an assistant director. Making making sure that you're treating them like people because some people see them as so, because there's so many of them that they are cattle. And I don't like that. Like I always press upon my PAs. Thank your background at the end of the night because they don't have to work for you. They don't have to do what you tell them to, to tell them to do. They don't have to do, right? right? Like, I mean, they're, everyone's here to work, but also like they're, they could give you a hard time. And if it was a good day, let them know they did, did amazing. Let them know that they did great. Like everything looked great. I always think my background, even when I know it's cold outside, when it's like a very difficult scene, or if it's like a lot of movement and there's like a lot going on, I'm, I will always, in the middle of said, like, thank you background so much, you're doing great. Just that little, just a little encouragement, because they are doing great, and people need to hear that shit. You know, people need to hear that. So I'm glad, Matt, that you brought up background, um, because that's a real big section of being an assistant director, is like dealing with background. And it's also what is awesome about being an assistant director is that you can get really creative setting background. That's why I love being a second second, because I love setting background. I love dealing with them. I always have such a good time with background. And there's so many different personalities that it's like, and I feel like I can be down to earth with them. And there's no like, we're, just, we're here, right? We're even, and I and I love that they're like working with me and we're making it work. And then sometimes I'm always surprised that some, some of you guys are like really good at like making it look really great, you know? Cause some background are just like, They're not, they don't really get into like, get into it and they don't really do a lot of movements and stuff like that. Um, so uh, uh, Matt, also it's so awkward for me when I make eye contact with celebs. I know I'm not supposed to say anything, but I mean, George Clooney looked me in the eyes the other night and smiled. Is it okay to say hi? Of course. If uh, an actor makes eye contact with you and smile, he's like, hey, <laughs> like we're all human, right? There are some actors where, they don't want you to make eye contact. I mean, I think I got that note one time on a Bruce Willis movie and they were like, don't look at him in his face. And I was like, what the, f <laughs> what? Like, I didn't understand, but that was the note that I got as an additional PA. And I was like, what is happening? But like, I think that if a celebrity or a high profile actor 
you know, talks to you or whatever, like there's nothing wrong with being like, how's it going? You know? So, and this happened to me when I worked on the path. I don't know if you guys ever remember the show. It was years ago. I was an additional PA and I was, I was just like locking it up near construction at the stage. And if you guys know Aaron Paul, he was like one of the stars or the star on the path. And I think this was like a Hulu show or something like that. And like he was walking to set and I was standing there at my lockup and he walked by, went by me. And then he backed up. He looked at me. He said, hey, how's it going? <laughs> I was like, oh my God, hi, I'm doing fine. Great. And then how are you? <laughs> and then he was like, I'm good. And then they proceeded to walk. That tells me a lot about who he is as a person. He's some big star and then he did not have to take those couple of seconds. He was walking to set. He was about to go. Camera was ready. And he decided just because he saw me, just like some little PA in the corner of construction locked it up, he just stopped and said, hey, how's it going? Like, that made me feel seen as a PA. I was like, oh my God. Like, those things matter so much. So don't take those those moments for granted. And don't take it for granted for like, oh, well, no one's going to care if I say hi to them or whatever. Like, no. Like, say hi to people, greet them, and know their names. Like, that makes everyone's day, like, that makes my mood change. When someone asks me my name and who I am, I'm like, oh, I'm so-and-so. Like, hey, how's it going? Like, that, like, I, I'm, I'm just real big on, like, let's start the day off in a good vibe and let's keep going forward because some people just don't make it a thing and it's like, Let's have some niceties. Let's have some pleasantries. Let's act like we're like, you know, we love what we do for a little bit. Because there are, oh man, and this is a subject on my, my list is that you have people who complain. And I swear, I don't, I, I wish I have to take a poll. I got to work with more assistant directors. But there are a section of assistant directors of just complainers. All they do is complain. And I cannot, I cannot just deal with someone who's going to complain. Like, I guess I'm in a way different, uh, like, mental game or mindset or life philosophy or something. But I don't want to complain about my day. Let's know the problems. Let's fix them. Let's move on. Let's progress in our day. Let's have a good time. Let's enjoy what we're doing. Let's look at this as like, let's not see the problems as in just problems, but like it could be worse. You know, like I'm all about that glass half full, where some people are choosing to see the glass half empty. And when someone chooses to see the glass half empty, they love to complain about it and they love to spread it. And then other people are, are going to look at that or the situation as also half full, right? Or half empty. So with, when you have someone who is like spreading good energy versus someone who's spreading the negativity, it's like, like it, I just, they come together and then sometimes the complainers win because people love negativity. Our brains are, are I think hardwired to avoid the bad, right? Not embrace the good. So it kind of takes a lot of work on someone's end to kind of see the positives in everything. Where it's like, we're we're based on, we're like primal animals, like we're based on fear. Like we will avoid all the things that cause us discomfort, cause us pain, cause us hurt, cause us like things that make us feel awkward or weird. So like it's hard for us to kind of have that positive mindset when you're on set because things, every, everything, like, I mean... When I wrapped the movie that I just finished in January, mid-January, and one of the things that my boss said to me, one of the ADs, they go, Amber, I'm so sorry I brought you on this shit show. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> I was like, just stop right there. I was like, what do you mean? I'm like, this was great. I learned a lot. This was amazing experience for me. I got to work with Jack Houston. Are you fucking kidding me right now? I got to work with Michael Pitt and Jack Houston. And I, and I don't really tend to like actors. And it was really funny because I, we were the only department that gave out rap gifts to our department. We had these dope ass fucking jackets. I probably, like, I don't know if you saw some of my pictures in, um, on my Instagram, my personal Instagram. And I think, no, they're not on my Beyond Film School, but A Sherms 2 one is my personal Instagram. If you want to see these jackets, I have a post about wrapping this movie. But the fact that she was like, I'm so sorry I brought you on this shit show. I was like, no, like I learned so much. Every day was different, new challenges. I learned so much as a second second. It was just like, I chose to see it as like, there were challenges, I met them and I, and we got there. We got what we needed. We got to the end, you know, we got that movie. So like I saw it as like a learning experience and I saw it completely different than how she saw it. And she just saw it as like some fucking dumpster fire. And I was like, no, not at all. 
definitely perspective, perspective for sure. And complainer ADs are the worst because as assistant directors, like we talked about like your responsibility as an AD is like logistics, problem solving, blah, 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 making sure everyone knows what's going on, communication, making sure the actors know what's happening, like making sure that people know what is going on, play by play, smooth day, efficiency, but, but set morale is also your job, set morale. And I'm like, no, really set morale is your responsibility. You are the voice of the set. Yes, the director is a leader. Yes, the director of photographer is a leader of the set. They're not setting morale. They definitely affect it. But because you are always the one to make announcements, do your safety meeting, you're going to tell the crew always what's happening. You are the voice of the set. And you can use that power for good. <laughs> so use it for good. You can be there and you can be an asshole and you can yell and you can be like, yeah, we're gonna get through our day. Blah, blah, blah. It's gonna be horrible, blah, blah. Or you can be like, you know what? We got a lot of work to do. Let's, we're gonna go after it. We have this, this, and this going on. We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna kill the day. You know, like, and I always, when I call the company in, I'm like, happy Monday, y'all. It's day three. We're gonna fucking kill it. Let's do it. Like, and everyone's like, woo. It definitely gets a different vibe. Right? When you call the company in, how you call the company in on the walkie and how people hear you, it's like your energy and how you decide as the voice of the set affects everybody. And I think that there are so many assistant directors that don't take that into consideration enough. They take it so lightly. And if you are not a presence as an AD, you are in the wrong line of work. You are in the wrong line of work, okay? If you're an assistant director on set that's quiet, has no stage presence, and not commanding, you're just like, what are you doing? Like, I'm sorry, there are some ADs who are definitely, they're, they're, they have a presence, they're kind of boring, their personality is kind of blah, but they have a good day, and they're not like, you know, they're like mediocre. I'm like, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. They lack in personality, whatever. I'm a bit like more dramatic and energizing and stuff like that. So I'm like trying to have fun, making sure people know what's going on. But also on the flip side, no one, everyone knows not to fuck with Amber. <laughs> I don't know what I do to make sure people know that they're like, you do what she says. <laughs> I don't know. Cause I, I try not to be mean, but also if sh like push comes to shove, I will be ready for a confrontation. So it's like being nice, compassionate, empathetic. I want to let people know I care. I want to make sure everyone's gonna have a good day. I want to make sure that everyone knows that I'm going to do my best to serve the crew. And when you know that, and when you know that is your job, you look at it a little bit different than just complaining that so-and-so doesn't know what they're doing. Well, how about you guide them in the right direction? Right? So, and I could talk about a conversation that was had with uh, a friend of mine and an associate, we're all ADs, and they chose to look at it like, oh, this person doesn't know what they're doing, they don't know shot lists, they don't know how to shoot a movie. Well, as assistant directors, if you have a first time director, I feel like it is your duty to make sure you are guiding them in the right direction during prep and on set. Like, if you're experienced, like, I love first time directors because then I can kind of like guide them in the right direction where it's like, I'm not molding them, but I, I feel like I might be instilling nice habits, good habits in them. So I think that it is taken too lightly when it comes to assistant directors knowing that they are the morale of the set. They set the tone. And you can tell when you're on an episodic show, like The Equalizer, like um, NCIS, like SVU, Law & Order, all of these shows that are like 23 episodes long. Yes, that's a season that's too damn long to work on. But like when you have a set of ADs that are this way, then you go to the other episodes where it's like they have even and odd. So assistant directors, there's like usually five, five or six on a show. And the first and second, um, rotate. So like there's a, a even episode number ADs and then there's an odd. Uh, so it's like they'll switch out back and forth. So, and you can tell the tone difference when you have two very different teams. And season one of the Equalizer, it was like a revolving door of like every time we got to evens, there was a new AD team and it was a new vibe. But we definitely didn't like the odds because they were like toxic and they were narcissistic and they were like, they abused all their PAs and they treated people like shit and, it was, and they thought they were funny. It's like, no, no one likes working on your episode because you're dicks. <laughs> but like when we had to change over, we're like, oh no. <laughs> it's like everyone knew the vibe they brought. And that's the power of an AD is like your AD team definitely has the power to make or break a set. Trust me on that. Trust me. So if you're producers out there, producers, 
when you ask the AD what their style is, they're going to lie to you. They're like, oh, you know, like, respect everybody and this and that. I don't scream. Every AD in an interview will go, yeah, I'm not a screamer. I'm not, I don't yell on set. Bullshit. <laughs> 90% of those Canadians do yell and they do scream and they are assholes. So I'm like movement. I'm trying to train PAs who want to be ADs and they want to be like, you know, I think everyone overall, I think just just needs to be more compassion on set, more empathy, but also like we got to do the things. We got to do the things. We're going to do them efficiently. We're going to do our job because I think that people work better when they're happy. Is that, I don't know what you guys think in the chat. Like, let me know. Like, do you think that people, when they are happy at their job, they work better? I have come to find out that when my PAs are happy, when they're being rewarded for very good things, they do better. They work harder for me. And I think that would go as far as to say that crew as well. So it's really funny. And I want to mention my PAs because it's like, shout out to the movie that I just did, the PA staff. I love them. And I would give them gold stars. And this sounds so stupid, but... I was like, I want to like show them that I noticed that they've gone above and beyond. They're doing a good job. So I started just giving out gold stars every day. I put their name in our PA and in the, the chat and I did put a gold star if they did something. And they're like, oh my God. And like, they loved it. And then now it's been like almost a month after we wrapped that movie. And like, they would stay in the chat. They're like, I really need a gold star today. I'm like, you guys all get gold stars today. <laughs> it's like that little reward, that just that little thing that says you did great. Like, I want you to know, like, you get it, you, I'm acknowledging that you did something good. Like, that goes so far with staff. So I'm just going to get back to the chat here. I think I'm missing a lot of things. <coughs> Let's see. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Thanks, Matt, for asking me how am I just as a human. I am so good. Thank you for asking. I feel like I'm catching up with Beyond Film School. And, like, I am kind of nervous about my class next week. Actually, I always get a little nervous. Um... Let's see, I'm going back down. Um, I'm glad I answered your question, Patrick. I'm originally, okay, so, oh gosh. Um, Matt, you see, like, everyone loves working at the stage. Getting back to my, the stage days, like, man, everyone, it's like so, sometimes, I, I like working on location. I don't, I don't like working at the stage over and over and over again. I don't like repeated days at the stage. I like being on location because I'm moving a lot. I love company moves. I'm like, I'm weird. <laughs> Like, I love working in, in location because it's like there's more things for me to do and I stay busier and it's like more moving pieces. It gets my brain going. So, like, I tend to like location more than stage dates. But sometimes uh, you really could use a stage date just to kind of just bring it down a little bit and just, like, kind of relax for a second. So, yeah, I do love stage dates sometimes. All right, let's see. How does one become a background actor? Um, I think Matt – oh, Matt, I, maybe you might be actually uh, – better suited to answer this question, Matt, if you're still on this live stream. George Pearson, how does one become a background actor? So there are casting companies and it's like Roman Candle casting. There's like Central Casting. And Wait, George, you're in New Jersey. Let me just check. I think you're in New Jersey. Yes, as you're in New Jersey. You're in East Orange. So like you can create a profile on those casting agencies for background. Like I think if you just do a Google search, New York casting agencies, background casting, like they're going to come up, but like central casting is the biggest one. Okay. So you can like put your picture and your things on there and then they'll, sometimes if they need you for whatever, then they'll, they'll hire you as non-union though, just so you know. You need three vouchers to become SAG, uh, to get that union rate, just so you know. Uh, Let's see, Raul, did background acting is a serious business? I have a friend who did background for Spielberg's West Side Story when it shot in New Jersey. She told me that was a, a fun headache set. I can only imagine that set. That's probably amazing. Um, the new Mean Girls musical is shooting in New Jersey, and they had a poster for background actors I submitted for it. It'd be fun to try background acting. I do a local theater as a hobby. That's nice. So, yeah, um, I actually know the AD team on Mean Girls musical, so I just wish you all the best on that movie. <laughs> I hope I, it should be a fun shoot. I mean, musicals are really fun to shoot. Um, yeah, people, uh, yeah, Matt Wilder, people complaining at boss told me one time you choose to work in this industry. You don't have to be here if you don't want to. Yo, for real. Exactly. And that's the thing is some people like they take for granted where they're working. And I just had a conversation with my boyfriend about this. I'm like, we are so lucky to be doing what we're doing. Right. I'm just like, yes. 
Like I get, to, like the fact that I can come on the equalizer a couple days a week or a couple days a month and Queen Latifah will be like, hey Amber, what's going on? How's Nutley? How, what's the life update? Like she wants to know how I'm doing. What the, like that's mind blowing. Like that, like an act, a ma like a major actor is like, how are you Amber? That's amazing. That woman doesn't have to think about me. She's got like 50,000 projects she's working on. She's got so many things on her mind. She's got like a couple pages of dialogue. She's also trying to remember on the day, you know, that we're shooting. But that, that she takes the time to be like, yo, Ember, how's, what's up? How's it going? And I just like chit chat with her for a couple seconds. You know, like that is amazing to me. Like working with great directors, people who are creative. And I just see, I get to see the magic happen. Are you kidding me? This is what I've always dreamed of. This is what I've always been like, wanted to do. I mean, since I knew that it was actually a feasible thing for me to actually do. Cause I like, when I started out, I was like, film like I didn't even know it was like in the realm of possibility for me because I've come from some humble beginnings you know what I mean so yeah that is so true man I'm so glad you bring that up because that is so true you choose to work in this industry you don't have to be here if you don't want to fucking get out I mean we can we can filter out all the complainers and have everyone that's grateful to be there it might be a completely different type of set I'm just saying so Ruby Latka I don't think Ruby you've been on the chat so thank you for joining me Ruby Hi, I would love you advise moving up to assistant director through being a floor runner, production assistant, key PA, second, second, AD, up to first, if you just start out in film after a career change. Wait a minute. Okay, so Ruby, I just need a little, um, a little more backstory. Like, where are you at right now? Because if you are a floor runner, that means you're kind of in broadcasting, I think. And the, it's kind of weird if you're in broadcasting because broadcasting and then when you're working on like narrative, it's two different worlds. So you need to expand your network a little bit. But when you're a floor, oh wait, a floor runner. Oh no, sorry. But yeah, floor runner. So you guys call them runners out there. That's right. I'm so sorry. I went on a tangent because like a floor director is a different. Um, so a, f a runner, a production assistant, key PA, second, second AD, up to first. But yeah, this is the line, the ladder that you're on. Right. So unless I don't know what your job, I just need a little bit more information from you, Ruby. So like, let me know moving up. I would say like, make sure people know your goals. That's the one thing I want to say to everybody is like, when you're talking about being anything in film, being anything really in any industry, if you're trying to do anything, talk about what you want to do. Like if I didn't talk about being or wanting to be a first AD with a casual conversation with a friend of mine when I worked at this production company, he would have never thought to had me to have me on his little short film that shot for three days in the Catskills as his first AD. And that was my beginning because I decided to talk to a friend about like, you know, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do this. This is what I want to do. And he was telling me about what he wants to do. And it was like, it, it was just like completely, you know, if you don't talk about what you want to do, if you don't tell people what your goals are, then no one can help you get there. And you need other people to help you get there. I don't care how introverted you are, because I'm fairly introverted. I can't, I gotta recharge. I gotta like, you know, I love people, but also I need time to myself. I got I, I gotta do a lot of like me time and all that stuff. I don't care if you're introverted or not. You need people in the world to help you get where you need to be. I don't care what industry you're in. I don't care like what it is. Like you need people to help you get you where you wanna be. So start off by telling people that you're already, if you are already in the realm of, um, I guess maybe it seems like Ruby from what you're saying is like moving up as assistant director. Like, I feel like you're in the circles, right? So like, if you know you want to move up, like I know, like I've been saying for years to literally everybody who's ever asked me, what are you trying to do? I'm like, I'm trying to be a first AD. That's what I do. Like I'm a first AD in the indie world. And now I can't do indies cause I'm in the union, but now like, it's known. I have first AD experience, my resume is top notch, and like now I'm working toward that goal. It is not like this secret. <laughs> like when you know Amber Sherman, you know that Amber M. Sherman is trying to be a first AD. That is the goal in movies, right? I don't want to be an episodic first AD. Let's not, listen, I've had debates with my boyfriend about this. Being a first AD on TV is not where I want to be. <laughs> but if I was hired to do a TV show, I would definitely do it. <laughs> okay, so... Ruby, I just need a little bit more from you to answer your question more efficiently. So Obi-Wan Martin, what I hate most is the complainers who just do the bitching to others. I'd prefer if someone has an issue with me, just tell me instead of bitching to someone else, get it out and then we can move on. Yes, 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 yes. Because 
I, when people start to complain, and a friend of mine, she complains a lot. So I always stop her dead in her tracks and I say, well, how can we fix this? Like, what is the, what can we do to fix this, right? Like, that's what I try and do. And I always combat the complainers with, well, you know, this could have happened or that could have happened or, or I always say, well, you don't know that person's situation. Like they might've been five minutes late because they, you know, got to a car accident or something. Who knows? We don't know. Five minutes late in the car accident would be way longer, but flat tire or, you know, something. I always try to put myself in that person's shoes of the pers- of that perspective of that person, because you don't know everyone's situation. You can be like, well, they should do this, this, and this. Well, you don't know what their life is like. You don't know if they have three kids. You don't know if they're going through a divorce. You don't know if they're like, you know, maybe they just quit smoking. Maybe they just quit drinking. Who knows? Everyone's got their own thing. You don't know why that person did what they did, why they were mad or whatever. First things first. And I think with complainers, this is a real, real interesting like a factoid, but usually with complainers, it's they are, oh gosh, I totally lost my train of thought. Man, because I'm like tidbit. Okay. Um, when complainers are complaining, they're, they really are, are stuck on what things should have happened. Right. And they're, and they're, they just expect like, Amber wants to be a fearlessly, sorry, I'm just saying, <laughs> George Pierce. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, on this like complainer tangent. But okay, so complainers love, like, they they love the negativity, and they love the fact that people are going to wallow in that negativity, and they just, it's like a, um, I kind of love this, I forget what quote or where this comes from, but like, simple people complain, and then like, this like other, what you talk about tells the level of intelligence, right, and complainers love gossip, so complainers are at the, like, the lowest level, like, complainers are the gossiper people, right, and then like, and then certain that like the next level is like average is like they talk about events and like things are happening in the world. And then people who are smart or people who are like trying to progress are talking about ideas. So I just I, I love that. And it makes me think of like what complainers are all about on set. And it's like it just they just want to spread and they want they're miserable and they want other people to be miserable with them. It's like, ah, uh, but complainers, I usually stop them with like, well, it could be this or how can we solve this? And I always kind of come from a place of like, well, you know, this person, they had that happen. And that's why this happened. Um, okay, so let's see. We got the the background actor thing. Um, I love the idea of gold stars. Thank you, Ruby, because like I thought like maybe it was dumb, but like I love getting a gold star too. So I looked at it as like, and it was funny because some, sometimes like the, the PAs would be like, Amber, you get gold stars today. I'm like, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, register with them it's free yeah so yeah matt thanks for letting us know that info about uh the background and how to get into background because it is free and i forgot to mention that it is free to get these profiles online and stuff if you register um george actually i used to live in jersey i am in pa now my family moved here way back oh okay gotcha so you're in pennsylvania gotcha gotcha patrick you need to go okay so shy when someone is shy and this is like some weird like deep diving into like psychology of brains and all this stuff but when someone is shy that is a person who is lacking in self-confidence and I used to be shy and I would say maybe I was not that confident as well I had an attitude problem I was like fuck that I'm gonna do whatever I want I'm gonna do whatever whenever blah blah blah. I'm like I'm very rebellious at heart and by nature but also like me talking to people I'm always like (laughs) so I always bring my most confident self forward first and that's that helps with shyness right so like and and there's always this like debate of like when someone's introverted and when someone's extroverted and this this and this and like introverted people are not exactly all of them 100% of introverted people are not shy right Right, wait, wait, a hundred percent of introverted people are, are like not shy. Like some people, the, the giant misconception is that if you're introverted, you are shy. That's not a fact. I'm very introverted. And some people are like, wow, you're really outgoing. I'm introverted because I need alone time. I don't, I don't dislike being around people, but I can only do it in small doses. And some people, when they see me on set, they're like, wow, there's no way you're an introvert. What do you mean? You're like very talkative. You're making jokes. You're funny. Well, when I'm an assistant director on set, when I am running set, I see that as I'm stepping into a role. I am playing a 
part, right? I am stepping into a performance. And my job as this is director, I am there to perform as the best first AD I can or the best second second as I can. And I think about it like, like it's a weird, like maybe, maybe it's like outside myself or whatever, but being an AD is part of me, but also it's like this other part of me that I could grab from where once we wrap, once I wrap a set, I go to my car. <laughs> talk to anybody because <laughs> I've exhausted all of my energy that I can. And even one of my set PA classes, now my set PA classes are like six, six and a half hours long for two days in a row. And when I do my classes, right after I'm done, I can't talk because one, like my vocal cords are like very, like they're, 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 I guess tired. They're very tired and sometimes they're sore and sometimes they hurt because I'm like talking so much. And also I have to remember to project properly, all this stuff. But after those classes, I just want to sit down, have like a tea, have a hot toddy. Let's, let's shout out to hot toddies because that is my favorite drink ever. I love me a hot toddy because it is the season for hot toddies. It'd it be February and all that jazz. I have a couple more months to get more hot toddies in. And please, please ask me what a hot toddy is because I'm happy to tell if you tell you guys if you don't know what a hot toddy is. So yeah, I like to sit down after my class and just have a hot toddy. <laughs> Give my vocal cords a rest, be by myself and just chill and sit down and just kind of like take in like and evaluate what happened in my class and all this stuff. So, and I guess I can take that as well after a set day because I am so tired after a set day. Like mentally it is draining. It is physically draining, mentally draining. And, and it's like, you do a lot of thinking and on the fly. And like, you have to be a quick thinker when you're assistant director, because the problems are going to come your way. Like, like they're going to come from all odd directions and you're not going to know like, okay, the background bus was a la late a half hour. And now the background's going to be a half hour late. So what do we got to do with this? Oh, and then now the actor won't get out of the chair there. They did something. It's like, so many things are going to go wrong <laughs> and you have to figure out how to make the day go no matter what. You have to figure out how to make the day go. So it's like, whew, be prepared and do what you have to do to kind of like make sure that you're doing best, what's best for you. So Patrick, with you being shy, I need you to go out of your comfort zone and do what you have to do to be more self-confident. Be confident in yourself. Know that you're resourceful. Know what your strengths and weaknesses are. And like, you got this. Like, I don't care what it is or whatever. Like, you need to branch out and do something that's uncomfortable. Start a conversation with someone that you may, you think you might have a connection with because that connection may take you places that you have no idea where you're going to go. Like, the opportunities for you in your film career come from any, any place, any and everywhere. And it's so unexpected. It really is. And I really, I think I'm a perfect example of that just with me, you know, talking to my friend about like my first AD job that he didn't, if, if it wasn't for that conversation, my life probably would have been completely different because once I got that first AD gig, I had that on my resume and then I was recommended. And then other people were like, wow, she's really great. Like the word got around that I was a decent AD. So it was like, if I didn't do that job, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. I'm just saying, like, all these things, it's like that weird happenstance. Like, things come out of nowhere. It's weird, right? Yeah, I feel like I'm missing some things. Okay. Um, let's see. We also got told back in the day to do a clean slate protocol, so leave your shit at the door, and next day everyone gets clean slate. But toxicity is horrible, especially as we are lucky to be here. Yes, Obi-Wan, I like this that you're saying that because the thing with that is, like, I tell my PAs this, and, and I think as a leader to tell your staff that tomorrow's a new day, clean slate. I don't care what happened today. We we'll come back tomorrow fresh. That is so, so important to tell your staff, to tell the crew, to tell, you know, if you are a leader, to tell your team that doesn't matter what happened today, like, let's start fresh tomorrow. Let's, let, let's start new. And it's like that really gives people a clean slate, and that makes them feel better. And that kind of like... I think frees up some space in their mind to get a little more focused and maybe more clarity and maybe reflect on what did happen a little bit like clearer. 
because maybe they messed up the day before and they're like, you know, they fucked up or whatever. And maybe there was something, maybe it was tense, maybe, it, but like you start the day new the next day. And I totally believe in that. I very, very much believe in that Obi-Wan. So say, thank you for saying that. Cause that's so, so important, especially as assistant director and as someone who is leading a team of people who are very, very new in the industry, because the AD department, we have all the set PAs. Some are more experienced, some are super green, they have no experience, some are in the middle, some are just about to become AD. So it's like varying levels of experience. And one of the things that I didn't really get to mention is the fact that <clears throat> part of your job as an assistant director is going to be training PAs. And I think that a lot of ADs don't like to do this. <laughs> but when you think about it, you have the power to train the PAs the way you want them to work for you. And I want to give a shout out to Rebecca. Uh, she's one of my set PA trainees. I worked with her on, on Friday. She took my class in 2019 and she's working her way up and she's on the equalizer. And I'm so proud of her for like really sticking it out because I, she's been on the equalizer for three seasons and she's dealt with a lot. And I know her personality and she's just, I felt like she's really, really grown. And she told me on Friday, she was like, you're like an evil genius. And she's like, I told Ebony about you. And I said that you were like an evil genius. And I was like, why? <laughs> and then she's like, you're like training future, your future employees. I'm like, yeah. And like one of the reasons why I started Beyond Film School is because one, I wanted to help the people that were like me, had no idea how to get into the industry, had no, no, no connections, zero connections, like really no idea how to navigate the film industry at all. And the other reason was, as I was getting more and more jobs, it got harder to find set PAs I wanted to work with and set PAs that knew how to do the job. So the reason why I started the set PA class is because if I was able to train them, I was able to bring them on my jobs. <laughs> so like I was able to train them. They're paying me to train them to get into the industry, but also then they get to be on my job and then I get to pay them. <laughs> so essentially it's like the production pays them. So like I get a good PA, production gets a good PA, they get paid for the day, they get the experience. I feel like it was like a win-win. So when you, when you have like a team that is new, you can train them the way you want them to work for you. And some ADs do not give... PA is the time of day. They don't want to train them. They just let them make their mistakes or they fire them when they make mistakes. They don't want to make the effort. They don't want to waste the time and effort and, and you know, the, the, the time that's needed to train the new people in your department. Because, I mean, when you hire PAs, you, you sometimes are going to get like, you, you interview them, you look at their resume, but then they end up being something that you didn't realize. Maybe there's personality clashes or something. You never know. Right, but is your job as an AD to train your staff, to make sure they know the job, to help them, you know? And I think sometimes, and I think maybe I see this more in New York, is the set PAs in New York have huge responsibility. And like the paperwork PAs doing time cards and the PRs, and that's a huge responsibility. You know, cast PAs are like getting, they're landing actors, they're putting in the hair and makeup, they're telling actors the play-by-play, -play, and the background PAs are like making sure the background get paid and they're organized, they're getting through hair and makeup. It's like, that's really, really big responsibilities when it comes to production. And I think that when you go to the third area, it's like a lot of like the additional 80s are doing this job. And the, I mean, if you're trained in New York, you can basically work anywhere as, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not trying to be like putting New York on a pedestal or anything like that, but I feel like we put more weight on our PAs, which I think ultimately is kind of unfair for what they're being paid, but also like, but also they're getting more experience. So like, I kind of feel I have like an internal battle with this because the way I am as an AD is that I know I get like triple or quadruple and sometimes more than that than what that PA is getting paid. So I feel like I'm going to take the weight. And this happened on a show I worked on where I was the base camp AD and I'm getting paid like crazy amounts of money. I'm like almost getting paid a thousand dollars a day, which is like crazy when you think about it. When you're going from 
two ten a day to a thousand dollars a day, it's like, wow, my life has totally changed, right? And the PA said to me, she's like, why are you doing all this? Why are you doing so much? I'm like, the fuck are you talking about? Like, I'm helping you with running base. I'm like, I'm doing the things. Like, I make sure that I know that I'm talking to the actor, talking to her, making wardrobe. Blah, blah, blah. And then she was like, well, no, most base camp ADs don't do that. I'm like, why wouldn't they? I'm like, I told her straight out. I was like, I get paid more than you. Therefore, I want to take on more responsibility. And I don't want you to get blamed for something that I know I could have prevented. And it's like, I trust you, but also I should be helping you with your day. So there's, there's like a lot of, there's a lot of debate on how ADs use their PAs. And I think that because I get paid more and because I am ultimately responsible for what you do or don't do, the mistakes you make, like I wanna make sure that you're doing your job right. So I wanna make sure I'm guiding you in the right direction. And some ADs will just like let a PA flounder and fail and then they'll be like, oh, well, it's the PA's fault. No, it's your fault because you're the AD, you're the one responsible, and you're the one that's supposed to guide them in the right direction. So when PAs get fired, like, I don't know if, if, if any of you guys have been PAs and you've been fired for something that was just like maybe a dumb mistake, but I think that sometimes the ADs are just not accountable. They, do, they don't want to take the hit. Where it's like, if my PA fucked up, like, and this happened where like there was a golden time situation, and Matt, you know what golden time is, where the we didn't take the names of the 11 people that were on the bus that landed two minutes after the golden time hour golden time is when they get double pay basically any time after 16 hours they get double the amount so they get their day rate times two basically it's a lot of money in production golden time is like everything that 80s want to avoid because it costs production a lot and we didn't get the names of the people on the bus and my second ad she was upset with us but she mostly was mad at the PAs. And I'm like, I missed it, you missed it, the additional AD missed it. Like all three of us ADs missed it. We didn't even think about grabbing the names of the people who were on that bus. Now there was like this whole thing where it got mixed up with SAG and everyone was claiming they were on the bus. Some people were not on the bus. It was like a whole, it was very, very dramatic. So because we didn't grab those names, something as simple as the names and numbers of the, of the people who are on that bus to actually, hey, these were the people, we took, a, we took a list, these were the people on the bus, would have solved so many problems. But a lot of, that what ended up happening, and I, I'm so mad about this, what happened is, is that one of, our, uh, one of the ADs blamed the PA for this. And I was like, no, we should be accountable because we didn't tell the PA to do that. It's like, you know, like that's us. That was our mistake. So that kind of made me mad when you throw a PA under the bus, it pisses me right off. And any assistant director that's going to throw a PA under the bus, shame on you. And I don't want to work with you. I'm saying it now. <laughs> I'm not taking it back. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it so much. Okay. Um, let's see. Thank you, Ruby, for liking the gold stars ideas. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. We're going to show this. One. Obi-Wan, for some reason, every time you go and you write a, a thing, it's like it, <laughs> it like blocks it for me and I have to like approve it. Um, let's see. Um, we also, oh, okay. So Ruby, that's correct. Brilliant advice. Thanks. I'm currently in broadcasting. Right. Okay. So you are in broadcasting. So I was on the right track and have done some PA work on short films. Really love it. And just wanted some tips on how to move up. Just Ruby, so just make sure that you are making sure that people know that you want to move up, where you, where the track wants to be. Like if you have a trusted person who is above you that you can have conversations with and like maybe who's like a semi-mentor or something like that, definitely make it known that you are trying to move up and this is the position you want to be in because there are a lot of people who are going to want to help you get there. Um, let's see. Uh, Obi-Wan, we also got told back in the day to do, to do a clean slate protocol. Oh yeah. Okay. I just read that one. I'm sorry. Um, more like Amber's free list leader. Can we clone Amber? Cause every set would be infinitely times better with Amber. Oh, thanks Obi-Wan. <laughs> People love being on my set. I will say, let me say, let me say that first. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, Andrew, what do you think about high end TV versus film production? As you know, I'm new and AD is a route for me, but going on four months TV production gives me fear of missing out on great film production. Andrew, this is definitely a common problem for a lot of people. And this happened to, um, my, I guess myself, because when I think about being hired on a show that's 10 months long, and then I feel like, wow, I really might be missing out on a movie that I really wanted to be on or something like that. I definitely 
get that. But like you, you have to make the right decisions for you and just know that I feel like filming never stops. So after a long gig, but this is only like, that's not like only four months. Four months is like nothing compared to like those big shows. So four months is like do four months and then something's going to, something's going to come up. And I feel like I definitely don't want that whole fear of messing out thing to happen. I don't have that because I always appreciate whatever comes my way, whatever I'm on. So if I'm offered some four month TV production, like why not? Like, let's see what that can give you. I think for me, I don't want to do shows that are, I don't like doing like um, the law and order stuff. I kind of try to avoid and the like, I mean, I like, I love working on Equalizer and if I was on that all, whole season, like I think the only reason why I survived a whole season was because it was action and stunts and all this stuff, and way different material than some other stuff that is going to be out there. So like, like when I was on New Amsterdam, I could only do one show, one of one season of that because the, the material on that is just the same stuff over and over again, the same, the same sets, the same locations, the same stuff. I need something that's going to be a lot of variety all the time. Let's see. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I'd much rather be on film. And I think making sure that you make it known that you want to be in film, Andrew, is very much, I, I, it's, it's valuable. So you make sure that people know where you want to go. And I think if the more you say it, you're like, yes, I'm going to get these movies. The more you say it, the more you're going to be focused on, and seeing the opportunities and you're going to notice more of the opportunities that you actually want. As long as you're like saying it out loud to people that you're like, yes, I want to do more movies. I don't want to do TV. And, and I, th- I think as long as you're, you're actually kind of like focusing and you're saying it out loud, it actually will, I guess like sometimes, because when you're thinking about like the manifestation and like focusing on stuff like that, it's not that you're like manifesting fucking magic in the world. It's like you're training your brain to see those opportunities. You're like bringing, bringing this to the forefront. You're like, oh, this was right in front of me and I didn't notice before. So just like definitely think about, first of all, being grateful. Because if you are grateful, <laughs> you tend not to have that FOMO, if that makes sense. Because I don't have FOMO. Because I'm like, every day I think about everything I'm grateful for. So I think that FOMO is definitely something that you have to train your brain out of. And I think being grateful for whatever is in front of you, because it's like, I'd rather be on a production than not be on one. I'd rather be on TV production than be on nothing, right? Like, yes, my, my, my preferred project would be film, but... If I didn't have anything, I'd be on TV without a doubt, right? So I'd rather be on a set than not be on set. And I always say that any day on set is better than not being on set. So um, one Marco, yeah. Wait, Marco, you've been here before. You've definitely been here before. I think I definitely noticed your your screen name. So hello, thanks for joining. And if Stanley Kubrick would get you an offer to be his AD, would you take the job? Oh God, I don't know. <laughs> I think I actually had a conversation about this being an AD for big directors. I don't know if I want to be, <laughs> I had a whole debate about being a big director's first AD because I feel like I'd have no power. But then that was like my really fucked up perspective, I think. <laughs> so I think maybe, I don't know how I would feel about being a big time director's first AD. Although, I mean, the, the other side, what my boyfriend was saying, he was like, well, I would learn so much. I'm like, okay, fine. You would learn a lot. Okay, great. But I feel like maybe you might get more, like pushed over a little bit. And then maybe that's my own fear, like working. So I don't know if I would take the job. Sorry. I think I, I think I, I wouldn't take the job. Um, oh, Obi-Wan, thank you for joining me. I know you're off by now, but thank you for joining me. And Virgie, hey, hello from Montreal, Canada. I just did my interview at the DGC to become an AD. Oh my God, congratulations. I hope it went well. Let me know how it goes. I'm always interested in how you guys are doing. I love, the, like, if you guys involve me in your life. I love it so much. Um, uh, Matt, I like working films better than TV. I also love working on comedies. The set is so much lighter and fun. I worked on the other two and it was a blast. I haven't worked on enough comedies. I wish I worked on more because I always find myself in like action movies for some reason or action something, which is fun. All of it's fun. Let's see. My goodness. Oh, I've been doing this for almost two hours and I think I'm going to wrap it up. I think I'm going to wrap it up. I didn't realize my boyfriend's here now. <laughs> so I think I covered everything I wanted to cover about being an assistant director and yeah, I think I covered the complaints and why I love being an AD. Yeah, I don't think I really talked about why I love being an AD so much, but I I love it because I have 
all of the pieces. I can see all the pieces. I know my power in that position. I know how I can make the day better, how I can make the day smoother. And if there's a problem that I can solve, I feel better like knowing that I'm in a position that I could help someone, you know, solve that problem. And I love that. Whereas like, if I'm a director, I might not be able to be that position. I might be causing the problems. <laughs> so I love being the one that can control morale and I can make the day better if I can, and I can make a smooth set and I can communicate with crew and I can have a good time. And I just, I love the fact that I can, you know, train new filmmakers, whether they're trying to be an AD or not, I can help them on their path, because I the, the the PAs I really like and the the ones that I'm like rooting for, I always ask them like, what are you trying to do? Because whatever you're trying to do, I will get you on the path. Like if you're trying to be an AD, yes, like I want you on my next show. I want you to be a key. I want you to be you know the key PA or whatever. I want to help you with your goals. So when you make those connections on set, know that there are people, and, and I know not everyone's like me, but there are so many people in the film industry that are going to want to help you. And I think that gets forgotten a lot is that a lot of us, yes, there are some jaded crew members. There are the people who are going to complain, but even my complainer AD friends, the complainer, like, the, and yes, the complainer IDs are, are, I have them. They are my friends. They also want to help. They want to help the next generation. They want to train the new PAs. They like, so they may be the complainers, but also they're like trying to help the next people, you know, come up as well. There are so many people in the industry that are like trying to help you. And if you mesh with someone, you make that relationship, you make that connection, like that is so valuable. And I think that just doesn't, like, because I think when people think about film industry, they're like, it's so hard to get into, it's who you know. Yes, it's exactly who you know, right? But there are, once you know those people, once you're in the circles, once you're starting to get out there and get a name for yourself, it's like more and more people are going to know what you want to do, and they're going to want to help you if you vibe with them. Now, I may not vibe with somebody, like this is a perfect example, with people in my set PA class. I opened up, because I used to interview for my set PA class. I used to interview and I used to screen them. Where like, if this is someone I want on my set and whatever, I used to have a very different structure. But then I opened it up to everybody, whoever wanted to be in my set PA class. And the reason for that is because I thought, who am I to just say no to somebody if they're trying to be in film? I may not vibe with someone. One of my set PA trainees, I, I get along with a lot of my set PA trainees and I become fr close friends with a few of them. Like I see them on set all the time. We hang out. Like I've become real close friends with some of my set PAs. It's crazy that like I've become so close with some of them. I could never imagine the relationships I've gained from some of my trainees in my classes of just being friends with them. And I think when you take that and you're, you, 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 you ultimately think that you can affect their life and you want to help them. Like, I, I can't believe that like I've actually been able to help the people I have been. And like, I've always wanted to know what they wanted to do. And I wanted to make sure that they know that I'm, uh, that I'm in their corner and whether or not I vibe with them, I could find someone that will vibe with that person, right? Some of them are really great and we get along. Some of them I don't really, I wouldn't hire, right? I'm going to be honest about that. Some of them I won't hire, but they will succeed anyways because they've taken the tools I've given them and they vibe with someone else. Like, let's be honest, like I don't vibe with everybody. And people are like, oh my God, I would love you on my set, but some people don't like me. It is a fact. Not everyone's going to like you. You're not going to vibe with everybody. So you have to find the people you vibe with. And that is like the goal when you're in the film industry is to find the people that are like you. You know, <laughs> maybe you are the complainer AG. <laughs> maybe you are the complainer PA or the complainer crew member. There are others just like you that you will vibe with you and will hire you on the next thing because they like you. So it's like everyone has their own group everyone has their own vibe and people you are going to vibe with someone you're not going to vibe with someone but and and my set pa trainees are the perfect example of that where there was this one trainee where i was like this guy is lost in the sauce i can't i don't know if i'd ever hire him i gave him one day on a shoot and i was like oh my god i can't and you know, i it, it just was kind of like me and him didn't mesh cut to like a couple years later he's like hey amber do you have that call sheet that like i was on that one day i needed da, 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 da. And he was like i'm a second ad and i'm trying to make a call sheet and i was like what like he succeeded even though me and him didn't vibe he found his own way he found his own drive he found his own people to mesh with and i was like very very proud and that just gave me more confidence in like how i'm doing this for people it's like not everyone's gonna vibe with me but they're gonna take the tools and they're gonna succeed regardless and they're gonna find their own people so it's all about vibing with the right people and like finding your way with the people you vibe with. I like, honestly,
I'm gonna go to the chat really quick before I wrap this up. Um, <clears throat> your your memory is correct. Yes, okay, one Marco, your memory is correct. Uh, after my request, you made a video about script supervisor. Thanks for making that video. Yo, I will say that was a really good suggestion because I I didn't think about making a video about script supervisor, and I was like, you know what, maybe I could. I know a lot about it, and I get so many views on that, and so many comments, and a lot of like, uh, I get. It's funny because I get script supervisors that watch that video <laughs> and like complain to me about certain things I might have missed, and I got like eaten alive that I said scripty in the goddamn video. It was so horrible, but I'm I'm glad that. I made the video for you and you suggested that because that's a really good video that like gets a lot of views on my channel. So thank you for that suggestion. Um, Maddie, I like your point of being grateful for what you work, uh, for what you, oh God, I can't read, for what work you have had. There we go. <laughs> Since I'm still early in my career, I'm much happier having some work rather than none. I'd feel a lot worse if I didn't have any work. Exactly. Like I'd rather be working than not working and I'd rather have a day on set than not. So yes, Maddie, 100%. Um, Matt, thank you so much. Uh, such great info. Thanks, Amber. Croissant. I love the fact that your name is croissant. <laughs> I don't know why. I have a candle that smells like croissants, by the way. I got it for Christmas. <laughs> for people new into in their career, how much income do you think it takes to feel stable, to feel comfortable, rich? Okay. First of all, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. To feel comfortable and rich are, okay. So you said to feel stable is one thing, feeling comfortable is a, another level, and rich is the other. Like, you, did you purposely do that in three layers like that? Because that's three very different levels of income, right? So um, now this all, and like, I don't know. I'm not going to give any financial advice or anything like that. But here's the thing I'm going to say is that you need to live beneath your means. So if you're making $15 an hour as a set PA right now in New York, depending on what network you're working for, because NBC decided as of this year to pay $17.25 an hour, not $15 an hour. So uh, do with that info what you will. Uh, if you're making $15 an hour and you know you're like, okay, if I'm on a staff job, I'm making $1,000 a, uh, a week maybe, and then $4,000 a month. If you are living and you're like paying a $3,000 a month in rent, you are definitely not living beneath your means. If you have all these subscriptions and all this extra stuff, you're going out all the time, you are definitely not living stably, you're not living comfortably, you're definitely not rich. So you need to focus on whatever income you're making, you need to live beneath your means. And I think that does not get said enough in the United States as Americans. Um, I know all you guys are not in the States, you guys are definitely overseas or in Canada or whatever, but like I think this needs to be said for Americans is that you need to live beneath your means. And I think that's probably why I survive so long as a PA trying to get into DJ is that I made sure not to have, t uh, you know, renting and, you know, like a, a crazy good apartment that I couldn't afford or having a car that was like $500 of car payment. And then like, you know, your, the phone bill. Now, first of all, what I will say for people in America, your Verizon and your, um, what's the, oh, fuck, I can't even think of other, I know Verizon's like the main one, or T-Mobile, and you're paying like $100 a month. And even if you're on those family plans, you're like $67 a month. I'm sorry, like, that overseas is way different. Like what people pay for phone plans in the United States is fucking crazy. Um, I pay literally $20 a month. I, I'm on Mint Mobile. I swear to God, I will give you guys like all this like re referral links. <laughs> but I'm on Mint Mobile. I pay $240 a year or $250 a year for my mobile service. And people are paying that in like a month or and a half or, or two months, which I think is absolutely fucking banana. So like think about what you're spending. Like your expenses is gonna directly dictate how comfortably you live, really. So if you're a PA and you're just starting out, you need to start having some roommates or something. Like where I live now is very different from where I lived before as a PA. Like right, like right now, because I can afford it a little bit more, I'm in an apartment that is a little bit more. So I, I think that like you have to really think about your expenses and how much you're really making realistically monthly and like look at your finances and stuff like that and like, okay, what, what are the things you can do without? How many Starbucks coffees do you really need? Cause like coffee, spending money on coffee is like, whew, like, okay, okay, we're gonna find the referral link for you, uh, Joanne, because I pay like, I think I'm unlimited and I just started paying 30, 20, I think I paid $20 a month for us so long and then I paid like $30 a month or something like that. I'm gonna find it for you. I'm gonna find it. So before I wrap this up, get your last questions in. Um, I think I, I believe I talked to all the AD stuff. I don't know. I kind of went on all these crazy tangents based on your questions, but I love, 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 love when you guys give me questions. I love it. Let me, I don't even know if I can log in here on my computer. Okay, let's see.
you know, it's like highway robbery that like people are like paying this much for like service for their phone plans. It's like stupid. I can't even believe, and like, I remember I had a friend from Ireland who was like, yeah, we only pay like $15 a month. And I was like, what? And then from that point forward, I refused, I refuse <laughs> to pay any more than that a month. Like I was like, no way. Let's see. Refer a friend. Okay, great. Um, okay. This is send my email. No, no. This is the link, y'all. I'm gonna send you the link. This is like Mint Mobile, like crazy cheap rates in the US. I'm just saying. <laughs> I didn't expect it to be a thing, but it's a thing now. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Uh, any other questions? Let's see. Thanks for answering. I'm just new and curious. Okay, so, okay. I, I think I went really hard on the expenses and like budgeting and whatever, but like <laughs> I make more money, but I'm definitely not rich. Okay, like this is... <laughs> Like as a, a DJAD, like I'm making more money, but I'm definitely not rich, but I'm like, I'm definitely living the life that I want to live. So like, I'm grateful, very, very grateful for that. So, um, so I'm glad that you asked that question. Um, one Marco, if director is playing also lead role, oof, does, does that change any duties of a first AD on set? Now, that's a very, very great question. Thank you for asking that. Cause I did not even think about that because I've worked with a lot of first time directors, but I've also worked with, a, a a handful of directors who are also playing the lead role. Now, as a first, when you are dealing with the director also being the lead role, what kind of happens is that sometimes they'll have a co-director. I've not had that situation, but sometimes that will happen where they'll have like the writer with them and they'll have a co-director kind of like making sure that they're getting the performance that they want for their overall scope of the movie, right? And then also what happens is that the first AD sometimes is going to be giving notes to the director where that has happened to me where I was on this web series and my friend hired me as a first and he was the lead role and he wrote and he was the director so when it was his scenes I was directing him like thank god I had the ability to kind of like muster up that creative side of me and because you know I do have that creative side where I was like I would tell him I would give him notes after every take and he told me he would ask me he's like Amber what do you think of this da, da, da. I was like well this kind of looks really off doesn't look natural so like you end up giving a little of those notes I think in the union world it gets a little more like it, it, they have to watch the take back and then they have to do it themselves and then they have to get um then they get the producers involved sometimes sometimes the the producers are going to have more notes so it just depends on the situation how indie it is how union it is like what the budget is because then if you are the first and they're also you know you're kind of like directing what i have found is that when you're in director brain mode you definitely are not thinking about time and as a first ad you are supposed to be thinking about time you need to be out of this scene by this time how much time for this time 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 it's always like where are we in the day are we on time are we behind whatever right so when you are thinking about performance and creativity and oh this thing looks lovely and like oh my god ugh, focus and like you're thinking about all the things that make film great you are not thinking about that ticking clock <laughs> So, and I, and I re realized that that day when I like stepped into that role for the director who was the lead actor and I was like, oh shit, I haven't looked at my watch in a good hour. And I was like, where are we? And luckily we were okay. But like, you definitely don't start thinking about time when you start getting into that like performance creativity brain. It's like, my, it was mind blowing to me to have to do both and manage both. It was very, very hard. And yeah, I actually, I actually worked with, an, uh, an actor who was the producer, writer, and the director, and she, it was like, she, like, carpamentalized, like, things in her brain where it was like, okay, now she's gonna be a producer, and, like, okay, and you had to do this for her, you had to, because she was an actor, and she, like, whatever, however she, like, organized it in her head, you're like, okay, I have to ask you a director question, and she's like, okay, and, like, she would take a moment to kind of just, like, switch gears real quick. It was, like, it was it was very, very odd, but also awesome at the same time to actually witness this happening within her. So it was, like, okay, I have a producer question. So, like, for – and then, like, if someone had an actor question for her, like, she'd be, like, okay. Like, she would have to, like, mentally get into her character for a second. It was, like, amazing to see her switch gears like that. But you definitely have to kind of think of, of you know – 
creative stuff for them and like have notes because some ADs do not have the creative brain and they would not be able to handle if they had to give notes to the director as an actor. They wouldn't be able to do it. So just, just think about that sometimes if you are if you are a first AD and you are going to be working with the director who's also the lead. It is very, very challenging. And if you're not ready for that, just be like, you know what, this might be, this might not be the thing for me. You know, maybe I'll like step back and do something else or, you know, maybe watch how they work. Maybe still offer to be on that, be on that project, but just not as a first, you know? Um, <laughs> Joanne, like, yeah, your channel is awesome. Thank you for everything. Thank you so much, Joanne. Thank you. I think, Joanne, you're new. I don't know if you've ever been on one of these streams. Um, Matt Wilder, Mint Mobile, yes. How's your service? Dude, I, I have no problems with my service. And plus, also, it's on T-Mobile Towers. So I feel like this is an ad for Mint Mobile. So like uh, Ryan, what's his name? God, Reynolds. I best, he's like the owner now or something. Like he owes me money now. <laughs> but he, um, yeah, he like owns the company now. He like bought it or something like that. But yeah. I don't have an iPhone. I'm an Android person. I am anti-iPhone. Sorry, guys, who have iPhones. I refuse to get an iPhone. I refuse. I've been, I have a Pixel, Google phones, all the way, just saying. So when I saw like Richard III with Lawrence, Olivier, and Braveheart, I was wondering how this was working on set. It probably was amazing to witness this. Like it probably was very, very great, but also probably a little chaotic. This was great. That is, what is the usual schedule for your live stream? Um, I usually stream on Sundays once a month. Um, on, but uh, I'm usually, yes, Sundays at one, usually Sundays at one, not every week, but I try to announce them as much as possible because I am a working professional in the industry. I kind of have to work around my schedule and I'm day playing and whether I'm staffed or whatever, it kind of gets a little crazy because sometimes I have to work on Saturdays, sometimes I'm starting on Sundays. So I try to keep as consistent as possible, but I usually let people know what I'm, you know, when the stream is coming but usually Sundays at one is usually the safe time that I you do my live streams now my next live stream is going to be my February film resume review live review so if you want to submit your resumes you must submit them uh soon because I only take six resumes I only have the energy and time and voice <laughs> to do six resumes so that is going to be February 25th it's going to be that next live stream for resume review so if you have a film production resume that you want me to look at I will critique live online and I'll give you all the feedback and then everyone else who's watching the stream will give you their impression of your resume so if you are brave enough definitely submit your resume and I'm going to leave my email so you're going to email me a PDF. If you send me a Word doc, uh, don't send me a Word doc, your resume, for the love of God, okay? It has to be a PDF. You have to give me a PDF of it. Um, I don't look at Word docs, okay? So send your resume as a PDF to beyondfilmschool at gmail, okay? Um, Oh gosh, Silent Shred. Oh, welcome, Silent Shred. I haven't talked to you in a hot minute. Um, oh gosh, I have to get to. Uh, okay, one Marco. Currently, I'm a producer for a friend film, and I think on the set it'll. I'll be first idea. Nobody wants to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, kudos for you for taking on the responsibility. <laughs> yeah, no one wants to do it is like the common thing where like no one wants to run the set because they feel it's a big responsibility and everyone's kind of just like, mm -mm, no, thank you. <laughs> so good luck, Juan Marco. Let me know how it goes. Um, yeah, keep me posted. Maybe like hit me up on Instagram or something. I would love to know like how it goes. If you do end up doing it, I would love to find out how, how, <laughs> how it goes as far as like filming. Um, Silent Shred, welcome back. Cause I, I see, I, I feel like I haven't seen you in a hot minute. Um, when is your next out of the country gig? I have no idea. I am day playing right now. I'm hoping for something soon for, as far as like out of the country or out of the state. That'd be great. I want like a good movie somewhere. That'd be great. So I have no idea my next thing that's going to be out of the country. So, okay. I've been on for two hours and 12 minutes. Thank you so much for joining me guys. I really appreciate all the questions, all the comments for you participating and interacting with me and giving me all the things and, um, just all the love. I really appreciate you guys like really saying thank you and how you appreciate my channel and what I do. Um, so thank you so much for joining me on this live stream and I shall see you guys next time.